Good morning. We're going to get started with an invocation led by Pastor Ben Jansen of Crosstown Church, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilman and in his last meeting as Vice Mayor Mark Stonecipher. Please stand. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we humbly come into your presence now to ask for your help for your wisdom, your will, and your ways to be made known to us. As the psalmist wrote in the 85th Psalm, let us hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, only let them not turn back to folly. So we pray, first, that you will give us together today ears to hear what you have to say. As human beings created in your image, we have been given minds to think, but grant us that we might first have ears to listen for the wise and wonderful words of God Most High. We who hope in Christ know that you speak most clearly in your word, but you have also given to us a common grace to honor, respect, and value the reasoning of all of our neighbors. And wherever we might discern the path of peace, we can be sure that you are leading us there. So grant that we might be quick to hear slow to speak, that we might be led by your grace into a greater peace for all the citizens of our great city. We also pray, Lord God, for this peace that you alone can bring, to cause us to give thanks to you and to your dear Son, our Savior, Jesus of Nazareth, the Prince of Peace. Cause us to remember during this holy week how Jesus entered in, into Jerusalem, meek and humble. As we reflect on the meaning of Good Friday, and Easter Sunday, which we celebrate this week. Teach us that you speak peace to your people so that we might speak peace in your world. We who hope in Christ have been reconciled to God, who has made a way for peace by the blood of his cross. So we rightfully acknowledge that you alone can grant to us the peace we earnestly desire also with one another. And we recognize, O Lord, that the way of peace is to serve the interests of all and to reject the temptation to seek only the interests of ourselves. As we reflect upon the achievement of Jesus during Holy Week, may we recognize the victorious power over evil that came in our Lord's laying down of his life. And may we who worship Jesus be moved by a willingness to follow in his cross-shaped path. Finally, we pray especially for Mayor Holt and for each of our faithful servants on the city council that you will grant them unity of purpose and the conviction to govern and lead our great city with truth, love, and justice for all. Make plain your way, O sovereign Lord, and equip each of our city's leaders to be resolved to follow your way of wisdom. We recognize that all authority comes from God alone and that each of our city's representatives have been installed into office by God in order to serve the common good. So we honor them now as we pray for them. We thank you for giving them to us. We thank you for the commitment they have made to serve us. And we pray now the blessing of Psalm 115 over them. May the Lord cause you to flourish, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, the only wise God, our Savior, now and forever. Amen and amen. All right, I call this meeting of the City Council to order. Uh, we are at item three, Office of the Mayor. We have a pretty robust presentation docket today, so I will make my way to the front. Okay, why don't we start with our friends who are here for Black Maternal Health Week. <laughs> I'm 
Sure, I mean, anybody who wants to come up, I don't. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, everybody, everybody who's here for that or for any other purpose, <laughs> come on up. Okay. All right, so we have a proclamation proclaiming this to be Black Maternal Health Week, and we'd like to learn a little bit more about what that means and I would ask the clerk to read this proclamation. Whereas Black Maternal Health Week is recognized to bring attention to the maternal health care crisis in the black community and the importance of reducing the rate of maternal mortality and morbidity among black women as part of the observance of National Minority Health Month held in the month of April. And whereas more women die in the United States from pregnancy related complications than in any other developed country. And whereas in Oklahoma, black women account for 10% of births statewide that make up over 22% of all maternal deaths according to the Oklahoma State Department of Health. And whereas structural racism, gender oppression, and social detriments of health inequities experienced by black women in the United States significantly contribute to the disproportionately high rates of maternal mortality and morbidity among black women. And whereas every month in Oklahoma, 70 women suffer from severe maternal morbidity, either from a life-threatening diagnosis or undergo a life-saving procedure during their delivery, and at least one woman dies due to a pregnancy-related complication. And whereas 80% of maternal deaths could be prevented by cost-effective, timely health care before, during, and after childbirth, including family planning, skilled attendance at birth, emergency medical services and care in the weeks after birth. And whereas we acknowledge the theme for 2022, building for liberation centering black mamas, black families, and black systems of care, while recognizing the continued efforts of physicians, nurses, doulas, midwives, infant mortality alliance, community health centers of Oklahoma Health Start Initiative, the Lynx Incorporated, Oklahoma City Chapter, Oklahoma Maternal Health Task Force, the State of Oklahoma Maternal and Child Health Division, and many others that are committed to equity for black maternal health. Now therefore, I, David Holt, Mayor of the City of Oklahoma City, do hereby proclaim April 11 through 17, 2022, as Black Maternal Health Week in Oklahoma City. Thank you. And it's my understanding that Councilwoman Nice uh, requested this be presented this morning, so I'm sure we'd like to hear a few words from you, Councilwoman. I did, um, and I want to say thank you to all that are here with us. Um, and one of the, one of the things that I, I do know, we have asked for this to be presented the last few years. However, this is the first time we've been able to do it in person, and I'm glad that we're doing it in person to bring to the light what is occurring for black women and it hit close to home for us in, in our city last year personally for uh, one of our friends that serves on our board's trust and commissions losing his wife after she delivered their son their first son at the age of 35. So this is very serious and to know that every third mom is not going to make it after birth is alarming and we must do something about it. So I'm, I'm glad that we're able to, to do this publicly and, and thank you to all who are here and thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. And the group nominated Kamisha to say a few words. <laughs> so you might introduce yourself and here you go. Thank you. Uh, good morning to you all. Um, and I want to bring acknowledgments to the chamber and the mayor and special thank you to uh, Councilwoman Nice for bringing the recognition of this um, huge topic that is plaguing all of our Oklahomans, not only here, but nationwide. Um, my name is Kamisha Busby. Um, I am an employee of the State Department of Health, but more specifically, my role there is the uh, Maternal Child Health Equity Project Manager. Um, so essentially what I want to do and acknowledge, especially as we move forward in the state of Oklahoma, especially with the support of your office um, and others, is to bring awareness of the traumatic events that plague our families. Um, 
mainly our birthing families, because it starts at birth, and we're a firm believer the life cycle is the primary resource of um, what impacts us from day to day. It starts at birth. It starts when mom is pregnant with baby, and it continues on depending on what her socioeconomic status is, what her education is, how we interact her with, with implicit bias or explicit bias, racial disparities, um, economic field, all of that impacts the birth of that mother and then sets forth that footprint of her access to care and the perceptions that her and her family look for when looking for care. So I like to thank everyone that's up here doing the great work that they do at their agencies. We have representation from March of Dimes. We have our hospitals here. We have uh, community health centers, which is at FQHC. We have um, members of the Lynx that's present with us. Um, we also have plenty of people here that support, including Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, um, who has a Stork's Nest program as well addressing those prenatal concerns. So we thank you for allowing us to be here this morning and be acknowledged. Absolutely. Why don't we show our gratitude to all that they're doing? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. You're free to leave or take your seat. It's really up to you. Okay, why don't we now bring forward our friends that are commemorating Child Abuse Prevention Month. So April is, in fact, Child Abuse Prevention Month. I think we had some of our landmarks lit up last night uh, for this cause, uh, lit up blue. And uh, so I would love to share a little bit more about what we're doing in Child Abuse Prevention Month. And I would ask the clerk to read this proclamation. Whereas Oklahoma City's future prosperity depends on nurturing the healthy development of the more than 162,000 children currently living, growing, and learning within our community. And whereas research shows that safe nurturing relationships and stimulating stable environments improve brain development and child well-being, while neglectful or abusive experiences and unstable or stressful environments increase the odds of poor childhood outcomes. And whereas the abuse and neglect of children can cause severe, costly, and lifelong problems affecting all of society, including physical and mental health problems, school failure and criminal behavior. And whereas research also shows that parents and caregivers who have social networks and know how to seek help in times of trouble are more resilient and better able to provide safe environments and nurturing experiences for their children. And whereas individuals, businesses, schools, and faith-based and community organizations must make children a top priority and take action to support the physical, social, emotional, and educational development and competency of all children. And whereas during the month of April, the City of Oklahoma City Parent Promise Prevent Child Abuse Oklahoma, the Exchange Club of Oklahoma City, the Downtown Oklahoma City Exchange Club, and the Oklahoma State Department of Health, in collaboration with their citywide partners, will be engaging individuals and communities throughout the city in a coordinated effort to prevent child abuse and neglect by promoting awareness of healthy child development, positive parenting practices, and the types of support families need within their communities. And whereas, I encourage all citizens of Oklahoma City to recognize that prevention starts with each of us. Now, therefore, I, David Holt, Mayor of the City of Oklahoma City, do hereby proclaim April 2022 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in Oklahoma City. Thank you. Obviously, a critically important issue. We've got some folks up here who have worked in this field for many years. And again, we have a nominee to speak for them, and that is Sherry Fair. I don't think this voting process is fair. <laughs> but um, Mayor Holt and City Council, thank you so much for all your support through the years because you're always um, let us come and, and bring awareness to this point. And we also have representatives from the Downtown Exchange Club, the Oklahoma City Exchange Club, our board, and the Health Department. And I just want you to know that 
really what we want to bring awareness to is, is lots of times for the state, I know we hover around 15,000 cases of substantiated child abuse and neglect, but most of it, in my opinion, really starts with um, unintentional neglect, and it's because of the challenges individuals suffer in, the, in their lives, such as maybe being undereducated, underemployed, and when you bring all that stress into the home, on top of the stress of raising a child, no matter how many resources you have, it, it things can go bad, and so we're here to go into the homes and provide um, home-based parent education and support so that we can raise healthy and resilient children so they can continue the wonderful legacy that we have here in Oklahoma City. And I'd also like to thank the other ladies that were up here and gentlemen that were up here because there seems to be a theme this month and it's critically important. It starts with um, being pregnant, healthy pregnancy, healthy mother, healthy baby, and then we can give them all the support they need. Thank you so much. Let's show our gratitude to what they're doing. Thank you. Okay, now how about our friends commemorating Litter Blitz? Mother Earth is in the house today. Hello. Litter Blitz, I don't, how many years do you think the city has done Litter Blitz? <laughs> 55 years. The city, by the way, is like 130 years old, so it was filthy before they started. But, <laughs> but uh, this is an annual tradition, and I know it makes a difference because it really wasn't something we did in 2020 due to the pandemic. And I, I really can tell I got more comments about litter in, the, in that year after April of 2020 than I feel like I've ever had. And so I think if you you would never want to not do litter blitz as an experiment to see <laughs> what an impact it makes, but you did try it once, and I think it made an impact. And I think we could see that every year when you fill those hundreds, if not thousands, of garbage bags, um, that, it, that it leaves some, a legacy behind. So with that, we are, of course, proclaiming April to be litter blitz again, and I'd like to learn just a little bit more, and so I'd ask the clerk to read this proclamation. Whereas litter is a critical factor in our city's economic health, and a clean city reduces taxpayers' costs to remove the litter and attracts new businesses. And whereas OKC Beautiful and the City of Oklahoma City are teaming up for Litter Blitz 2022. And whereas Litter Blitz 2022 is an effort to clean up neighborhoods, parks, streets, and businesses to help beautify Oklahoma City. And whereas neighborhood, civic, church, and business groups can register their teams to pick up litter on a date they choose. And whereas each team will receive a packet with free trash bags, gloves, and tips for a safe and successful cleanup. And whereas last year more than 5,000 volunteers participated in the community cleanup and over 100,000 pounds of trash was removed from our public spaces. Now therefore, I, David Holt, Mayor of the City of Oklahoma City, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2022 as Litter Blitz 2022 in Oklahoma City and urge all citizens to help combat litter in their parks, schools, neighborhoods, and other locations throughout our community. Really is a great and fun opportunity. I certainly encourage you if you haven't, um, even if you can't squeeze it into April, I bet you'd give them some bags in May. <laughs> so, uh, but to learn just a little bit more, we wanna hear from Natalie. Thank you so much, and thank you, Mayor and Council, for the recognition. And thank you to those of you who have joined us for a cleanup in the past. Um, I'm not wearing my overalls today, so <laughs> I look a little bit different. Um, so Litter Blitz is just a storied opportunity in our community for our residents to take ownership over our parks and public spaces. So anyone can put together a Litter Blitz team, uh, families, civic organizations. I hope all of you will consider going back to your workplaces or your religious institutions and organizing a cleanup. And um, perhaps we could do a little ward challenge if any of our council members want to organize a cleanup as well. Um, it's not only a chance to help beautify and sustain our environment, it's also a chance for social cohesion to bring people together throughout the community. So I hope you will consider joining us not only over the month of April, but all year round, keeping our community clean. All right, let's thank OKC Beautiful, Mother Earth, and everybody who makes Litter Blitz happen. Thank you, Lisa. Festival of the Arts, the countdown is on. Come forward. All right, indeed, next week, 
It is next week, right? It is. Yes, it's going to be Festival of the Arts Week, and so let's learn a little bit more about that. I would ask the clerk to read this proclamation. Whereas the 56th Annual Festival of the Arts produced by Arts Council Oklahoma City will officially open on Tuesday, April 19th, 2022 for six days of exciting visual, culinary, and performing arts activities. And whereas Festival of the Arts is recognized nationally as one of the most spectacular fine arts festivals in America, featuring more than 144 visual artists, live entertainment on three stages, delicious local food, and activities for all ages. And whereas Arts Council Oklahoma City is continuing its commitment to making Festival of the Arts a sustainable zero landfill event by utilizing recyclable and compostable materials and promoting eco-conscious practices, receptacles for recycling and composting will be available throughout the festival grounds. And whereas 2022 Festival of the Arts co-chairs Kristen Torkelson and John Sipner lead a team of more than 40 committees and 5,000 volunteers who donate their time, talents, and resources to produce the Festival of the Arts. And whereas Festival of the Arts is Oklahoma City's annual Rite of Spring and focuses on Arts Council Oklahoma City's mission to bring the arts and the community together. Now, therefore, I, David Holt, Mayor of the City of Oklahoma City, do hereby proclaim April 19th through the 24th, 2022, as Festival of the Arts Week in Oklahoma City, and urge all citizens to join in honoring Arts Council Oklahoma City, the volunteers, and the artists who take part in this event. This, obviously, as stated in the proclamation, is a rite of spring. Again, you know, it was a rite of summer last year, but... <laughs> We've, we've returned it to its original location. It is a remarkable event. The, you know, it's one of the most volunteer-driven events in our community and obviously one of the best, uh, the highest participation rates of all our residents. We'd love to hear a little bit more, perhaps, from our co-chairs, Kristen and John. Sure, yes. Yes, um, so first of all, Mayor, City Council, we just want to thank you all for letting us use the, the, the lawn, for, literally, for City Hall because this year, we have exciting news that it will all be children's activities. So it's a great place to bring your family, bring your kids. Um, so we're excited about that. Yeah, no, we're, we're really thankful of all the city staff and organizations and really our, our volunteers, the community that comes together to put on this event, the 5,000 volunteers. You know, it's without this event, it's our largest fundraiser. It allows us to put on arts programming throughout the rest of the calendar year. We're really thankful to, for that, and we'd like to th invite everyone to the festival next week. Uh, our opening ceremonies are on Tuesday uh, at 11 a.m. here in the center of Bicentennial Park. Right, and I would add that the gentleman, of course, uh, always at work taking pictures, <laughs> <laughs> is, is going to be uh, presiding over his final uh, festival as executive director of Oklahoma City Arts Council. And of course, when the roads closed and I happened to find myself on the sidewalk last week, who was out there, but you know, unloading <laughs> tables and chairs or whatever else, but Peter DeLisi. And uh, so thank you. Let's show our appreciation to Peter, the co-chairs and the whole team. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Oh, I get to keep this, but you're gonna give it to me again next week, right? <laughs> All right, actually, I, I don't really have anywhere to put it right now, but yeah, yeah, thank you. It's beautiful. Um, okay, we're like halfway done, guys. Um, so now I'd like to bring forward our folks. Let's see, let's bring forward Sergeant Valdez. Valadez? Valadez. I'm really doing that for her. I knew how to pronounce your name. Um, okay, so we are obviously so grateful for your work, Sergeant, and you are about to be officially the uh, Employee of the Month. But we'd like to learn a little bit more about you, Sergeant, so I would ask the clerk to read this resolution. Whereas Sergeant Felix Valadez has been a city employee for 15 years and is a sergeant in the police department, and whereas Sergeant Valadez is a member of the homeless outreach team and police tactical team and the crisis intervention team. And whereas Sergeant Valadez is well known in our community for building trusting relationships with people experiencing homelessness. 
and whereas Sergeant Valadez connects residents in need with social services to improve their living conditions, thereby improving public safety. And whereas Sergeant Valadez has been recognized by several organizations for his solution-focused work on the homeless outreach team. And whereas Sergeant Valadez is a hardworking, loyal, and empathetic member of the police department who has a heart for service. And whereas this council desires to recognize Sergeant Felix Valadez for his dedication, professionalism, and commitment to the residents of the city of Oklahoma City. Now therefore be it resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City that they do hereby thank and commend Sergeant Felix Valadez, April 2022, South Oklahoma City Kiwanis Club Employee of the Month. Okay, now this is a resolution, so why don't we get a quick motion and second. All right, we have a motion and second. Cast your votes. I would like to vote aye. Passes unanimously. Sergeant Valadez, I hear more compliments about the homeless outreach team than almost anything else we do here at City Hall, and obviously you're an integral part of that, although I don't know how you can be on all these different teams. That sounds very stressful, <laughs> but uh, that is evidence of why you are in fact Employee of the Month, and we're so grateful for your service, and we would love to hear a few words from you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Council. It, you know, the homeless outreach team has come a long way. You know, I've got a great partner, George Anderson. He's probably just you know should be up here just as much as I am but um what we also have is a ton of support from our lieutenant all the way up to Chief Gorley you know they support us they believe in us and we get a lot of support from a lot of uh, the community services you know th their goal is to reach the homeless people that are living on the street you know and without them our job would be an absolute nightmare so we're grateful I'm blessed God's put me in, a, in this position for a reason so I'm very very grateful thank you thank you let's show our appreciation to sergeant Thank you, Sergeant. Thank you. All right, let's bring our quarterly safety stars forward. Thank you, gentlemen, first for your service to the city of Oklahoma City, and secondly, for your prioritization of safety. And we're gonna hear a little bit more about what that means. I'd ask the clerk to read this resolution. Whereas Jeremy Beach, Fred Kavner, and Kendall Hamilton are the safety team for the Streets, Traffic, and Drainage Maintenance Division of the city of Oklahoma City Public Works Department. And whereas all three take great pride in assisting full-time employees and contract laborers in furthering their careers within the city organization from resume building to commercial driver license CDL acquisition. They have assisted 10 division members with acquiring the Class A or Class B CDL. The safety team also provides vocational education, enrollment assistance, career counseling, and interviewing tips. And whereas the safety team has developed and implemented new policies that ensure the long-term safety of our employees, including the light duty program. In April 2021, the program was renamed the Stay at, Home, Stay at Work program and updated to give every employee the opportunity to manage their time following a workplace injury. The purpose of the program is to assist employees that have suffered a work-related injury or illness to return to full duty as quickly as medically possible. Stay at work duty assignments are designed to help employees remain productive and engaged in departmental activities which can assist in their medical recovery. And whereas in June 2021, the Silica Exposure Control Program was unveiled to clarify and set out the plan to protect employees from harmful exposure to silica dust that can potentially be present in the construction operations. This program provides employees and managers clear guidance on protection from silica dust and silica exposure. And whereas in September 2021, the safety team conducted the annual snow and ice training for all employees of the division. The week of training included equipment training, truck and plow training, operational strategies and tactics training, and training for the National Incident Management System, Incident Command System, which ensures weather events can be effectively managed to reassure residents that there will be passable roadways for snow routes in the Oklahoma City Metro. 
and whereas the safety team conducted three 16-hour work zone and traffic incident management courses with a total of 27 team members being involved in the study and implementation of the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices for Streets and Highways. During the course, team members are challenged with legal questions, traffic work zone planning, and the traffic incident management. And whereas the safety team has also assisted the Public Works Engineering Division in preliminary threat hazard identification and risk assessment for the river operations, river operations facilities and proposed river op operations facilities. Now therefore, be it resolved by the Mayor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City that they do hereby thank and commend Jeremy Veach, Fred Kavner, and Kendall Hamilton, first quarter 2022 City of Oklahoma City quarterly safety stars. Wow, well that's wonderful. Just really cool to hear uh, the details of all that. Thank you for you to you guys for plunging into those details to keep our employees safe and for learning all those acronyms, because that's, that's a mouthful. Uh, this is a resolution, so let's uh, get a motion in a second. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. I wish to vote aye. Passes unanimously. Um, Kendall, I believe, has been nominated to, uh, to speak, so we'd love to hear from you. Thank you to the mayor and the council for this resolution. Um, we put safety uh, foremost thanks to LaVita and Risk Management Division. We're able to continue to put straight safety forward. We'll continue to do that. Thank you. The most important thing is that all of our employees go home at night. So thank you so much. Let's show our gratitude to them. Thank you. Thank you. Yours. Thank you. Thank you. Yours. Thank you. Thank you. Yours. All right. Let's bring our Teacher of the Month forward. Welcome to City Hall. Come join me over here. <laughs> All right, Ms. Johnson, we would love to learn a little bit more about how you became and why the Teacher of the Month. And so I would ask the clerk to read this resolution. Whereas Cynthia Johnson has been named Teacher of the Month for April 2022 by the Foundation of Oklahoma City Public Schools and Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. And whereas Cynthia received a bachelor's degree in speech pathology from Oklahoma Christian University and a master's degree in elementary education from the University of Central Oklahoma. Cynthia is a third and fourth grade special education autism teacher at Nichols Hills Enterprise Elementary. And whereas Cynthia serves as an education advisory member at Oklahoma Christian University. In this role, she meets with incoming teachers or individuals who are thinking about entering the teaching profession. She encourages potential candidates to pursue a career in Oklahoma City Public Schools. And whereas Cynthia believes her greatest accomplishments and contributions have been finding strategies that support students with autism and determining how to help them become conceptual learners. She follows the student-centered theory of teaching by planning activities that encourage students to collaborate and cooperate with each other, allowing them the opportunity and freedom to explore while learning. Cynthia believes educators have a responsibility to provide a caring and stimulating environment that is safe, supports risk-taking, and encourages academic, social, and emotional exploration. And whereas Cynthia volunteers in the community in many ways, including organizing and participating in the annual autism walk for the past 14 years, serving as a volunteer coach for Special Olympics track and field activities, organizing and assisting the annual school supply giveaway, and care and share Christmas program at her church. She also volunteers as a song leading coach through a leadership training for Christ program. And whereas Cynthia is passionate about student success in the classroom, especially students who are serviced in the self-contained special education setting and students who struggle with understanding grade level content. She believes teachers must use methods to bridge the gap for students with disabilities and create classroom experiences 
geared towards higher level intellectual processes. Now therefore be it resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City that they do hereby recognize and commend Cynthia Johnson on her selection as April 2022 Teacher of the Month by the Foundation for Oklahoma City Public Schools and Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. Wow, well I know there are thousands more teachers like you, but and that's why our community is so great, but this is amazing. There's no question why you're Teacher of the Month. <laughs> And thank you so much for your service. But we want to make it official, so this is a resolution. So let's see if we can get a motion in a second. We have a motion in a second. Please cast your votes. I'd like to vote aye. Passes unanimously. Um, again, thank you so much for your service. We'd love to hear a few words from you, if you don't mind. I don't mind at all. <laughs> thank you. Mayor Holt and the city council. I asked him who paid him for this. <laughs> I'm not sure who this person is. Uh, seriously, I am very grateful. Uh, most educators, we don't do what we do for these moments. However, we're very thankful and honored because uh, right now, as you all know, uh, teaching is difficult, but teaching in a pandemic is even more difficult. Um, but we do what we do because we love what we do. Uh, I love all things autism, so if you're available June 4th, Susan Taylor Park, come and join us for the Autism Walk. I know I'm not supposed to plug that, but um, anyway, and if you're in the area, Nichols Hills, come by and visit us. We would love to have you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's show our appreciation to Cynthia. Okay, I will now make my way to my seat. We are still on Office of the Mayor. We are now at item 3D. This is the notification for James Cooper to serve as Vice Mayor the six-month period beginning April 13th, which is tomorrow. This is per the provisions of our charter. Why don't we vote on this? <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, then we have, okay, so items D through P are um, appointments to Board of Adjustment, Board of Appeals Building Code, Building Code Commission, Civic Center Foundation, MAPS 3 Citizens Advisory Board, uh, MAPS 4 Citizens Advisory Board, Mechanical Code Review and Appeals Commission, Oklahoma City Economic Development Trust, Oklahoma City Golf Commission, Mary Gardens Foundation, and the Trails Advisory Committee. Uh, we can take those with one motion. A word, please. I'm sorry? A word. Sure, uh, okay, can, yes. We can still have discussion in this. Um, I'd just like to personally say, as far as um, these, some of, not all, there are wonderful people to be appointed. Um, however, when, especially with looking at and asking for certain representation um, and asking about how to get that representation, um, I have difficulty understanding when we look at what we ask for as far as diversity, equity, and inclusion, and to know that our city has added over 100,000 people in the last 10 years, and we still choose the same five to serve on boards, trusts, and commissions is, is beyond me. I don't understand how that is possible uh, for that to happen. And I'm hoping with our DEI office that we have vested for our city that we pay a, a pay a wonderful person to do that we also understand what that means for us with these appointments so with that i will not be supporting um collectively this whole slew of folks that we have uh, because of the concern for uh, a few of those appointments about equity in the process all right. Do we have a motion and a second? 
Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes seven to two. All right, that concludes then items from the office of the mayor. And we now have items from council. We have item 4A. This is an ordinance to be introduced, set for public hearing uh, at our next meeting, April 26th, final hearing potentially May 10th. Uh, this is brought for, this relates to motor tree vehicles and traffic and has been brought forward by Councilwoman Hammond. Push the right button. Um, thank you. I meant to have a presentation that I um, presented at the Traffic and Transportation Commission and was delinquent in getting that um, to staff in time. But I did want to mention there was just an administrative oversight. Uh, Councilperson Cooper had also in, ex, uh, expressed interest in co-sponsoring this, so hopefully we'll have that updated in following agendas. But just a quick sort of um, overview of what this, um, what this proposed update would do. Um, just a little history of how we even got here um, in, I think last, so last year's uh, state session, um, the governor signed Oklahoma House Bill 1770, um, and that took effect last fall on November 1st. Um, it was authored by uh, representatives Dabrinsky, Fugate, Kendricks on the House side, and then Senators Weaver and Stevens. Um, essentially what it did was create language in our state statute to, um, effectively legalize what is called the Idaho stop, or um, some people call it stop as yield treatment of traffic control devices. Um, so it essentially allows a person operating a bicycle to treat a stop sign as a yield, um, and then uh, a red traffic light as a stop sign. Um, you either turn right or um, turn left or proceed through the light um, after stopping, yielding, making sure there are no other conflicts or hazards. Um, coming uh, down the road. So um, the reason it's called the Idaho stop is it was actually first passed in Idaho in 1982. Um, and since then, 11 plus states have um, legalized some form of this. A lot of it, a lot of them, um, it's kind of just a pretty simple copy and paste of the Idaho law. Um, but others, there's just little um, differences depending on, on the state. Um, and uh, after this House bill went into effect here in Oklahoma, residents um, and staff identified that we had a conflict essentially between our city ordinance and the state law. So this is really just to bring the city ordinance into um, harmony with, with the state law. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so we went to traffic commission March 21st and they um, recommended approval and I'm happy to answer any questions or I can send you my little presentation, but with just a lot of bullet points that I just read. So um, happy to answer any questions. We also have Steve Kreese here from uh, Legal who helped draft um, the ordinance and make sure that it was uh, in, in the right uh, harmony with the state language. I'll only add, um, and I, all those words are <clears throat> spot on. I'll only add as somebody who uh, biked from Paseo, like 28th and Chartel, um, to Northwest Expressway and Villa last Friday for the opening of the revitalized Belle Isle Library. Um, I, I can just say to the rest of the council, like, please just hear us on the need for this, to bring this in alignment with state law. Um, those of us who use a bike for transportation, I drove this morning, so I have a giant agenda uh, that I didn't feel comfortable putting in my backpack. Um, but there are other times I literally will use my bike to get to work, to get to recreation, to get to um, all kinds of places. And this law will make it safer, quite frankly, um, and more efficient to get to where I need to go. And so many other people in this community who use their bike for uh, transportation um, as well. And I would say if any council members uh, have any trepidation about um, bringing this uh, local ordinance into alignment with state law, um, we have Spokies. If you don't have a bike, and I'm sure either Councilor Hammond and I, and I really mean this, I've been thinking a lot about this, um, we would love to, I'd love to hop on a bike with you and move around downtown so you can kind of see what it's like um, to use a bike for transit 
um, to get coffee or wherever you all want to go, just so you can see why um, we're trying to bring this law into, um, into accordance with something they passed 40 years ago back in 82 in Idaho. So happy to do it. Thank you. All right. Any comments or questions? If not, I guess we could take a motion to introduce it. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. So this is now introduced for consideration. And as stated previously, there'll be a public hearing and then a final vote at our next two meetings. OK, moving on to item five, city manager reports. Mr. City Manager. We don't have any formal presentations today. We do have uh, a report that's in the packets on the council priority on maintaining strong financial management. It's been a council priority for many, many years. And I really want to acknowledge the leadership of the city council in keeping this as a priority. But it's um, a couple of the me measures that are mentioned in there is our AAA bond rating and our strong fund balance or our strong reserves that we have. And we're going to have a policy that we look at today that really helps to even further strengthen that on our fund balance policies. And so uh, maintaining those strong reserves is a real part of our uh, strong financial management. I appreciate your leadership on that. And that's all that I have, Mayor. Okay, um, and that brings us to item six, Journal of Council Proceedings. We have items A and B we can take with one motion. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item seven is request for uncontested continuances. Already listed on the agenda will be deferrals for items 11C, 11F, and 11L. What else might you have, Mr. City Manager? On page 14, item 11T1, unsecured structures. We have several. All of these will be stricken from the agenda. Item A, 1341, Southwest Grand Boulevard to re-notify for additional structures. Item G, 1738, Northwest 9th Street. Is the, uh, that property is now occupied. Um, item K, 536, Southeast 19th Street. The owner is secured. Item Q, 330 Southeast 42nd Street, the owner is secured, and 334 Southeast 42nd Street, that uh, property is now occupied. Then on page 15, on abandoned buildings, item 11U1, um, all of these will be stricken from the agenda. Item E, 1738 Northwest 9th Street, um, that is now occupied. Item H, 536 Southeast 19th Street, the owner is secured. Item L, 330 Southeast 42nd Street, the owner is secured, and item M, 334 Southeast 42nd Street, that is now occupied. That's all the items that I have. All right. Back to item eight, revocable permits and events. Item 8A is a revocable permit with Girls on the Run of Central Oklahoma for the Girls on the Run of Central Oklahoma Celebratory 5K. This is May 7th, uh, Stars and Stripes Park, Burt Cooper Trails, and Leslie? Yes. OK, Hi. we have I'm Leslie so Littlejohn. I'm so glad to be back here after a couple of years. Um, we are working to build back better. So we um, are going to have our 5K. We have 274 girls that are um, in our program this year. And they have all set a goal to finish a 5K on May 7th, 9 AM at Stars and Stripes Park. We would like to invite anybody who'd like to come to join us. Um, we are a self-esteem and self-empowerment program for girls that creatively integrates running. So if you have any questions or need to know anything from me? Uh, no, any questions? No? Um, this is in wards one, two, and eight, so I kind of just let everybody jump in for a motion. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's do it virtually here for a motion and a second to approve the permit. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Cast your votes when you get the chance. I know you're hanging by a thread here. All right, passes unanimously. <laughs> Thank All right. you so much. Have a great event. Thank you. OK, item 8B. This is a little different. A memorandum of understanding with Perfect Game Midwest for the OKC Challenge Youth Fast Pitch Softball Tournament. June 4th through the 6th. Um, I don't have anyone signed up on this item, but it is in Ward 4. Todd, if you want to take it. 
Absolutely, I'll take it. Uh, big fan of softball, you know, and I mean, if you look at how our city is entwined with softball and you look at season OU's having, uh, when you think about younger girls and, and what they're exposed to in this city in terms of softball, it's, it's fantastic. Love uh, girls athletics. So with that, I would move for approval. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, now we'll recess the council meeting and convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority, where we have items A through G we could take with one motion. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we'll adjourn OCMFA and convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority, where we have items A through C we could take with one motion. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we'll adjourn OCPPA, reconvene as the council. We are now uh, entering pages three and four, item nine, the consent docket. We have scheduled presentations for BM and sort of a pairing of BX and BY, and that's it. Is there anything else that anybody wants to pull out for separate vote or separate comments or discussion? Um, I'd like to just hear a little bit more about BH. BH, okay. BJ. Got it. Anything else? Okay. If not, we will take them in order, which means we'll start with BH. I might start with a comment on this because uh, I've been in some conversations about it. So, um, Councilwoman Hammond, as you as you well know, the bipartisan infrastructure bill touted that uh, a very specific plan for Amtrak expansion, which included expansion of the Heartland Flyer north to Kansas. And I always joke, it's not that we want to go to Kansas, it's that uh, it ties us into the rest of the, of the system. You know, when you can connect in Kansas, suddenly it really opens up the west coast and the northeast to Oklahoma passengers. And so I certainly used that a lot when I was advocating for the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Since its passage, uh, representat representatives of Amtrak have come to Oklahoma City and uh, are optimistic that we can see this through. There will definitely be matches you know, required um, as part of the process that has typically come from the state. Um, the state currently matches the operating costs of the Heartland Flyer South and would be expected to do something similar to the North. Um, and they suggested in their visit that kind of the first preliminary step was for us to do what we're doing today, which is to express our support um, for that expansion. That is obviously one step in a very long process that will involve the state and the federal government. Um, and they told me that, you know, they, they hope that optimistically they think a five-year timeline is realistic um, and we will see how all that goes. But today is simply expressing our support uh, to see that expansion as promised in the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Is that responsive? Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> I just, I, a lot of it is I wanted to highlight it and make sure that the yeah. public knew about this because it is a really huge deal. And I would argue that it's not just about connecting other places. There is actually a large uh, Mennonite community in Oklahoma that goes to Kansas, specifically oh. Newton, quite a bit. Mm. Um, and I've tried to uh, go to Newton for various events um, with uh, the, with Joy Mennonite Church and um, it can be hard to get there because uh, you do have to drag that. And, um, and even as somebody who doesn't own a car, being able to connect to Kansas City and some other places um, that are a little bit beyond Kansas proper um, is of great interest to me and in being able to utilize Amtrak for that because I know I can always go south to Texas, but mm -hmm. if I want to get to Kansas City, Chicago, um, anywhere uh, kind of as we go east, um, it's, it's really hard to do that. So I, this is a huge deal um, and I'm excited to see that we're supporting it in this way. So just wanted to highlight that. and say that sometimes we do want to go to Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. With this new information, I will scale back my Kansas jokes. Yes. Fair enough. <laughs> I don't want to insult them at night. 
Uh, okay, very good. Now, uh, item BJ. Mayor, can I? Oh, I'm yes, sorry. yes, sorry. I just wanted to ask, because um, I was just reading the resolution here. So it would go to Newton, and then does it go to, looking at a map, would it go to Kansas City and then Chicago? Is that what the connection would be? Do we know that? I'm not looking at the Newton map. Newton already connects to other places. So, okay. Yeah, so typically if you want to get to those places right now, you do have to hop a car to Newton, and then that's the sort of place you can get to a lot of other places from. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, item BJ, Councilwoman Nice. Yes, I just, while I understand and, and know what this is, I would like for it to be explained to the public. Mr. City Manager? Yes. So Joanna McSpadden, our Economic Development Manager, will give us an update on this uh, change that's being proposed. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Joanna McSpadden, Finance Department. I pulled up a map um, of TIF, uh, the Northeast Renaissance Project area. Um, so this resolution is taking what was TIF District Number 15, which we enacted in August of 2021. Those are the non-contiguous kind of blue areas that you see. There were six locations. Um, what we're doing with this is actually removing four of those locations that will now be renamed as TIF B to be enacted at a later date. And we will keep as TIF 15 the Homeland site and Marcus Garvey, which was the Harmony School Project. So those two will remain in the in the TIF 15, which is the clock has already started, and we'll hold back the others until they're ready to go. Happy to answer questions. Okay. Thank you. All right. No questions or comments. Uh, then we will move on to item BM. This has a presentation schedule. This is a uh, budget amendment to our fiscal year 2022 budget. This is a budget amendment. Uh, we had given some briefings to the council just to give you a heads up on this one because it's a pretty significant amendment that's being proposed. We do have an amendment to the amendment and Doug will walk through and change, explain that. It, the numbers that we explained to you when we went through the briefings are all the same. It's just there was an error in the spreadsheet that actually becomes the adopted budget. And I'll let Doug go through that and explain that. Basically too, this, this budget amendment, Doug will go into this as well, but the budget amendment really is primarily, there's other areas that get amended, but primarily the acknowledgement of the increase that we've seen in revenue this year in sales and use tax particularly. There's other areas, but specifically um, primarily in sales and use tax and allows us to be able to take advantage of that and get some projects completed. Yeah. So uh, as we uh, look here at the budget amendment, we're increasing 10 funds due to higher than expected revenues. And uh, two of those funds are the general fund and the capital improvement projects fund. We're taking some of that surplus in the general fund, transferring it to the capital improvements projects fund, where we'll be funding some capital projects. And as such, we don't want to double count that revenue because it's really going to only be spent in the capital fund. It's not going to be spent from the general purpose fund. So we need to reduce the budget by that transfer. So the original uh, item that you had didn't have that transfer backed out. So it double counted that. So it reduces uh, our budget. The increase, as you'll see here, is $85.4 million. And the amended version that you have here shows that that's the amount of the change. And so the total uh, budget also changes. And we'll cover that here in just a moment. But um, as we look at the general fund, $47 million is the increase that we're projecting over the uh, adopted budget. Uh, sales tax being the, the largest single piece there at $37.5 million. We've got numerous other uh, revenue sources that are up as well. I kind of like to say, you know, when it rains, it pours, and it's when it's good times, it's good times everywhere, and when it's bad times, it's often bad times everywhere too. So in this case, uh, things are going very well in Oklahoma City, and it, our revenues reflect that. So we're up $47 million on the general fund. In terms of how we're going to allocate that on the expenditure side, we've got some increases in costs. Uh, related to our operations. Fuel costs, of course, are higher, parts, services. Uh, we've got some street repair contracts that we're going to be increasing. And uh, we have an agenda item on uh, a little bit uh, later to increase support for river sport by $1 million due to the impacts of the pandemic. And so that's included as part of that operating budget increase. So that's $9.2 million. 
The second piece is to set aside funds so that we'll have a reserve available to match federal dollars uh, for these projects that, are, or that, that will be available for funding from the Infrastructure Act that was uh, passed last year by Congress. Uh, there's going to be a lot of money available for projects in Oklahoma City, and we want to be able to take advantage of that by having the matching money ready to go and uh, be able to uh, capitalize on that. And then we've also got some funding for our own infrastructure projects, uh, street resurfacing projects, sidewalk projects, uh, street enhancements, uh, a number of projects in parks uh, at the Bricktown Ballpark, the Canal uh, Softball uh, Hall of Fame or the Softball Hall of Fame Stadium, as well as creating a facilities maintenance reserve. Again, we've got just a lot of deferred maintenance in our facilities, and we want to make sure we can stay on top of that roof replacements, carpet replacements, painting, just the basics of taking care of your buildings. We want to make sure we've got that um, covered there. So that is are the infrastructure uh, projects. Now in terms of other funds, all the other sales tax funds are also being amended. So that's police, fire, zoo, and the general fund non-operating, which is the MAPS for uh, sales tax. Those are all being amended due to higher than projected sales tax. Our capital improvements projects fund increased. And that's the, the part that I mentioned, that's the transfer from the general fund. That's the part that we don't want to double count. It's really revenue in the general fund uh, and expense in the capital improvement project fund. Our hotel tax is, again, over target. As I said, uh, things are going much better than expected throughout the city, so hotel tax is higher than expected. We also have increased our internal service fund, specifically fleet services. That's where we purchase fuel for most of the departments, so their budget needs an increase. Uh, we have an Oklahoma City Tax Increment Financing Fund. This is where we receive state matching funds for uh, projects, and specifically in this case, the Omni Hotel TIF is receiving just under a million dollars uh, for that. And then the last one is in our Special Purpose Fund, where we receive donations. And the Civic Center Foundation has donated $900,000 for work at the Freedy Little Theater that the city will be conducting, and so that will be in our special purpose fund to make sure it's used for that purpose. So uh, overall, we're looking at an $85.4 million increase in the budget, which brings our total to $1,779,886,404. And so the amendment is being introduced today. Uh, it will have a public hearing and adoption on April 26th. And so uh, as the city manager uh, mentioned, unfortunately, we had a mistake in there and, and left out that correction in terms of the uh, reduction in the dollar amount, so I believe we'll have to amend the item now, but then the, the item itself can be taken with the, the amended item with the consent docket. So. Just as the introduction. Uh, yes, for the introduction, yes. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Doug, yes. uh, one question. Yeah. Uh, can you provide, perhaps not now, but in some type of written form, what projects qualify for the infrastructure uh, funds? Right, I, 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 we can work on that. We've got several people throughout the city that are researching the various yeah. uh, programs that are available and what those um, opportunities are, and I know we're, we're, we're really working to maximize and, that, but we'll- And many of the projects are still being developed. I mean, the programs are still being developed. So, I mean, we can look at what's available at this point. We've already had some that we've taken advantage of with like the Water Utility Trust, um, with the Water Resources Board having some additional funding there with that. So we can definitely look at that. Yeah, so if we could have excerpts from the actual law plus yeah. the city's interpretation. Okay. Yep. Just one clarification, mm -hmm. because it's a common issue, I think, throughout the city, and that relates to uh, uh, mitigation of flooding when we have heavy rains. Mm -hmm. If the area that needs some assistance or mitigation is private property. There's nothing we can do about that. Is that a true statement? I don't know the answer to yeah, that. I believe that's correct. It's I a general statement. Yeah, it's a general statement. I think the, the question would be how the grant is written. Like some grants do allow work like that, so I think it'd be how the grant is written. But in general, most, most cases we're dealing with public areas. Correct. And what I'm talking about is when, for example, homeowners associations have the responsibility for certain uh, creeks and, right. you know, right. uh, other mediation things to address uh, 
there's nothing the city can do, even with this additional funding to assist those organizations. Is right. that true? That's right. So even if they're like not for profit, we can't do anything to help them. That's right. Okay. Clarify that in, in your presentation, if you would. Thank you. So on BM, do we need to bring that up for a separate vote and amend it? Well, we need to amend it. Yeah, we need to have a vote on the amendment, which we can do now if you want to do that. Okay. So move. Okay, we have a motion. Let's do that virtually. A motion to amend item BM as distributed by the city manager. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Okay, amendment is adopted unanimously. Now we are back on BM and the consent docket as amended. Are there any other comments or questions about item BM? Uh, Mayor, excuse me. This is a technical question, Doug or Brent. So this, when we're talking about increasing our reserves, this will end up in our unrestricted fund balance going forward. And there's like five types of fund balances that we maintain. This is the least restrictive that this will fall into. So there's no restrictions on them. That's correct, yes. It, it would be in a, we're going to transfer it over to the CIP fund, so it's in a separate project that we can track uh, separately, but it would be un, unrestricted fund balance. Thank you. OK. No other comments or questions? Then we have presentations um, for BY and, to some extent, BX, I guess. Mr. Yes, city so this, this is the uh, Auburn McDermott, our assistant city manager, <clears throat> is going to uh, give us just a quick update. This deals with two issues. B BY is actually the additional support that Doug mentioned in the budget amendment for River Sport for this year due to pandemic uh, um, effects of the pandemic on the operations there. But then also BX is a consultant report or a consultant amendment to a consultant study that we're doing also to focus on river sport and I'll let Aubrey walk through that. Sure, good morning Mayor and Council, Aubrey McDermott. Um, I think I'll talk about the river sport amendment first um, because we are gonna follow up with doing an amendment to our consultant study to help uh, evaluate the operations and maintenance of the river sport facility. Uh, this uh, agreement, which is BY on your agenda, is an amendment to the existing agreement with River Sport Foundation. This amendment does four things. The first thing is it reestablishes the $1.5 million management fee for them for fiscal year 22-23. It also establishes that $1 million COVID pandemic uh, relief supplement to them for this fiscal year for 21-22. Then um, the third thing that it does is for other city facilities that were funded through MAPS 3, our agreements uh, allow the city to help with large capital uh, maintenance costs over $25,000. We're integrating that provision into this contract to be consistent with how we do that because if we have things on the river race course that are our capital expenses, uh, we want to be able to take care of that through our capital funds. And the last thing is that the, the River Sport Foundation has requested to increase the board of directors up to 25 members. This allows them to add more diversity to the board and expand the board's reach into the community. Um, so I know that we've had briefings on this. If there's any other questions, I know that uh, representatives of the foundation are here. They could answer questions for you and I'm happy to help as well. And, and I'll just say to tack on to this, we did mention in our briefings that the Parks Department does have a consultant looking at all the operations and maintenance and efficiencies of city park facilities. This being a city facility, um, and Melinda can answer more questions about that, is, is something that we wanted to tack on to that consultant agreement so the consultants could um, focus their resources, I think, up front and give us some more information back about the river sport. So that would be item BX on the agenda. And if, if you have any questions about that, Melinda's here too. Okay, question. So can the city have any input if the uh, board of directors is increased to 25? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Can the city have any input on who will be added to the board oh. of directors if it's increased to 25? The, the existing agreement has a requirement for the city to establish one of the members. I think it has to be an appointment by the mayor. And I believe Councilwoman Nice serves in that seat right now on the board of directors, so that's an automatic requirement of city involvement on the board. 
Right, I'm talking about increasing that number. Uh, this, that was not um, specifically added into this amendment, so it would remain that there would be at least one council representative on the board. If I'm misspeaking, you all can correct me. I'd like to see somebody from staff at least be added if not to the board, then as an advisor. So we, with, from a finance background. Right, we do have, uh, Doug is actually, our budget director, is actually on their, is it the operations committee? Finance, finance committee? committee. So they've got a finance committee, and so Doug is on the finance committee, so we do have that representation. And then the and parks department sit. is mm -hmm. there as well yeah. um, as advisors to the, mm -hmm. to the group. Yeah. Melinda's in there. You know, though obviously it has governing responsibilities, the board is in many ways a fundraising board. I mean, this is, a, this is an organization that depends heavily on philanthropy for its operations, and I, I, I think that's a big driver for the desire to expand the board, is to bring more champions for the facility, ultimately to our benefit, because they would bring in more philanthropic donations. Right. So does that answer your question about city involvement on the board with those three positions? Yeah, well, here's my concern. Here we are the last quarter uh, getting a request for a million dollars, and every previous request has come at the end of the year, and it was always with the uh, additional uh, information that we really need this. This is the one time, this is the one addition, if we add this, We'll, we'll be fine going forward. So after so many years of hearing that, I become skeptical. I don't know if next year there's gonna be a request again for a million dollars or possibly more, and it just goes on. I think that's one of the things that we wanna do with the consultant study is look at the operations. It's looking at the economic impact of the river sport facilities and the programs there, but also looking at the operations to determine what the level of funding is, you know, what level of funding is needed ongoing and how much revenue we can actually maximize is generated by the facility. So we'll stay in contact on that with River Sport. It's actually our consultant that's doing the work in conjunction with them, so we can stay in tune on that and bring back to the council what we see long term, what we think this might be, but also we can stay in touch with them as we're looking at this to make sure we're reviewing that, you know, earlier in the year, if we see any kind of potential problems, this one we really believe tied back to the pandemic and it was kind of a lasting effect. They thought they could make it through the winter and it just ended up that there wasn't enough other revenue that came in that was able to support that. Can we if, if I may, um, sitting on, on that board and on the finance committee, it's also important for us to realize, and this has happened all across the board, that a lot of your major funder and funder support has disappeared and have said no thank you as far as even trying to make sure they're maintaining their own foundations and or support and that's the unfortunate part of what has taken place in this circumstance not for I can't speak for the others but I can only speak for this this particular circumstance in the fact that now we are adding three or four major global sports activities to the river sport area and I wish the state would say, we want to give you all of this support. But unfortunately, a lot of that is going to rely on us to be able to, to make that happen. And as we know, what's happening, unfortunately, in Ukraine and in Russia, those competitions are now being housed in Oklahoma City. So this is going to be a game changer for this particular area and the fact that as we look at just river sport, yes, that was the intent coming in uh, to, my, to my knowledge of what this was supposed to do as far as the Boathouse District. But now we're looking at what the trails can do, what all of these other spaces that have been activated can also do and the impacts of us being able to work on the efforts of receiving and applying for more grants to supplement that and what that looks like for for the future and for those extra board members because of course um, beginning it was folks who were only vested in river sports we need some folks that can help us in addition to just those river sports folks that are invested in trails that are invested in outdoors so we can continue to activate those spaces in the way they need to be 
Can we move to the discussion about the, man, uh, the uh, consultant's uh, study? So who's performing this study? So Pros Consulting is a company out of Indianapolis that has worked with all sorts of parks and recreation departments across the country and most recently are working on our recreation programming study that is really looking at how our current recreation centers, community centers can be more impactful to the residents that are living around them. So in Pros Consulting, they have a specialist who has studied river sport activities across the country, and he has been tapped to come in to look at our facilities and how it relates to not only our city, but also regionally, and how our river sport can be better positioned with the current board's involvement and understanding of the economic impact as well as the recreational impact to our community and also the region. So Brian Trustee is actually engaging with us in that and um, really working a lot with the board and others in order to understand what the needs of our community are, but also the needs to financially sustain the operations of River Sport. So one of the activities of the uh, Riverfront Foundation is the Whitewaters facilities. Mm -hmm. Can you request that he compare and contrast our operations with those, I believe it's in Charlotte, Mm -hmm. uh, Charlotte, Ohio. and any other mm -hmm. whitewater facilities. And yes. let's look at the differences and are they experiencing the same kind of financial pressures that say this facility is experiencing? Yes. We may find that whitewater facilities is not as attractive here in Oklahoma as it is in other parts of the country. The decision to bring that in may not have been as good of a decision uh, as it turns out. So uh, I'm looking forward to that study and, and uh, please keep us posted as it uh, continues. We'll and, absolutely and, do that. Thank and, you. and with deep respect to what he said, he's obviously entitled to his view. The parade of major international announcements that we have had in the last few weeks, to me, absolutely validates. We absolutely made the right decision in 2009 to construct this facility. We have created one of the finest paddle sport facilities in the world. It's putting us on the global stage, and, and I recognize it presents different challenges, all things that we have tried to do in this city have, but I don't ever, uh, I don't ever want it to be left un unresponded to if somebody purports, and you absolutely are entitled to that view, Councilman Greenwell, but I have a very different view. I think this has been a, a home run for Oklahoma City doesn't mean it's not without challenges. We're working our way through those today, but um, it's, it's been such a great uh, benefit for our, for our city's brand. A couple of things, um, city manager. Number one, I'm excited about this consulting report and the parameters of it. And so what's the timeline for us receiving something along that lines? And secondly, uh, I know that, and I think it was David that, that requested it in the past that we have periodic reports uh, we don't get something at the last minute. Are we adhering to those periodic reports? Yes. Okay. And so for timeline, we just started engaging in those uh, meetings now with the board and with Mike Knopp. So we've engaged in those. We're starting to schedule the first stakeholders interviews as well as community interviews. We're really expecting the result of this study to be completed in four to five months. Outstanding. Thanks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so just to clarify um, a couple items. One, am I hearing correctly that part of the assessment will really dig into the role the pandemic played in, uh, in, in, in the decline and the need for this revenue? I, I don't think it's really focused so much looking back. I mean, it'll look at what we've done with operations, but it's more looking forward of like how can we maximize the facility? How can we ma maximize the reach from a marketing perspective? You know, what areas can we target so that we can maximize revenues there? And look at the operations as a whole. My question all along has been, you know, given the, the type of facility this is, if you could maximize the number of people that are going through that facility and their, you know, the memberships that are sold and all, if you could maximize that, can that sustain itself? Is there enough revenue that can be generated? And I don't know that we know the absolute answer on that. There was a lot of philanthropy up front that helped to sustain the operations for a period. And I think it's really trying to take a reset to look at this and say, how can we maximize the use of the facility, both with events that are brought into the city as well as maximizing revenues coming through the city? So, I mean, through the operation. So that's really what this is more focused to, is more the operation side, not necessarily evaluating 
what caused some of the challenges or looking back at what effects the pandemic has had? So I'm a kind of yes and on this. Like everything you're saying, I'm glad we're doing. But I do hear that critique from Councilman uh, Greenwell. I've been on the council, you know, where those requests have happened. And I think if we don't look seriously at the role the pandemic played to find out in other words, I want to know if, if when we did that last infusion, what could we have got to the place where you're talking about where the operations could have sustained themselves through the people who were coming had it not been for a worldwide global pandemic? I need to know that. Yeah, I, I, we, we, can, we can look <laughs> to see if we can help with that information. I know there's a couple of things that are just anecdotal to some degree, but there's no question it had an effect. Like for instance, staffing is this affecting everyone, having difficulty getting guides. Well, if you don't have enough guides, you can't run, and you, you don't, you're limited on how many boats you can run mm -hmm. through, which means you're limited on the amount of revenue it can generate. I don't have an exact number on what that is, but I can tell you absolutely that affects the ability to operate efficiently. So there's a few things that are like that that are really obvious. They even try to do some spacing because this is like a group activity, but doing spacing between groups, mm -hmm. which limited again the number of rafts that can run through. So there were a lot of ways that they had to amend and adjust their operations that really clearly had an, a, a financial effect on the operation. My guess is probably on the contributions from donors as well, because we saw such a tightening across the nonprofit world. And I just think all that, we need to spell that out. And I, I think some, like a consultant needs to do it um, because otherwise there's just always an undercurrent in this <laughs> current, um, but there's always an undercurrent in this city. Thank you again. I didn't mean it as a joke, but there's, there's a, there are people who will always look at, you know, some of these projects and just ask that question. Was it a smart investment kind of to the mayor's earlier uh, argument that he sees this project as one. Well, I think we need to make sure that for our people, we are able to show them what these variables are that have um, presented these challenges. Because if we don't, that undercurrent will become the current. And, then, and then, then it erodes the public trust as we head into a MAPS 5 or the next bond. I don't wanna be in that world. So that's, just, that's why I'm asking to sure. look back and do what you're asking. My next thing, though, is um, to your point about the operations, is this consultant looking like, look, I don't have kids. Y'all, many of y'all do. I just teach them. Um, where I'd love to know what, where you all are taking your children when it comes to like water events, like anything water related that is um, not, not necessarily the equivalent of what we're offering in the Boathouse District, but where, where do the people of Oklahoma City outside of that district take their children for anything kind of water related? Whitewater Bay, Frontier City, wherever <coughs> it is that we go. And then I'd like kind of a comparison in terms of cost and access, because if this whole council meeting today began with us recognizing Child Abuse Awareness Month, infant mortality things, and I think we just have to be much more aware and serious about the fact that a significant chunk of Oklahomans are middle class and they are working middle class. And, and not very many of them are upper middle class. And if you're upper middle class, God bless you and your success. But that is nowhere near the majority of our people. Again, I teach our children, I know who they are. And I wanna make sure that our kids have access to these facilities. Mike and Nikki, you all have done a wonderful job in recent years in increasing that access. I've seen literally former Jefferson Middle School students where I've taught at that facility. But I think until we can figure out how we can better get as many of our children and their families to that facility, paying in ways that they can actually afford, I don't think we'll ever get to that sustainability place until well, you balance that with donors. Yeah, and I think it's something we have to evaluate and look at. I will tell you the more access that you provide like that, discounting means there's more subsidy that will be required. There's, no, there's no question. So I think long term we're looking at this and saying that, you know, realistically it's going to require some additional assistance going forward and continued assistance. We're trying to look at how we can maximize providing the access, maximizing the facility, 
maximizing the donors, maximizing the reach outside of our region, you know, with outside of our city in the region. So we're trying to look at all of those aspects of the, of the operation. I just, the only other thing I'll add is I completely agree, I, and, and to the mayor's point, this is such an important, and Nikki made this case also, Councilwoman Knight, it is such an important place. I just would like for whatever that subsidy needs to be from the city, because Lord knows the state, whenever, I don't know, um, but I just want it to be a very accurate number so that we can just make that investment going forward. Like whatever it is, like make it so it works, you know? And, okay. and I would just add this, and for anyone who is friends with the Lieutenant Governor, please, you know, he's all about tourism. We need to make sure we highlight this space for our city and for our residents. And the fact to the point of what you were saying as far as our children, one of the things that uh, we have been committed to within the last few years is the diversity and inclusion piece of how we bring young people from all across the city to be a part of what's happening in River Sports area. How do we make sure they are a part of even the summer camps? How do we make sure they even get to touch a water raft? You know, even for our adults, as far as the ski, I still have yet to do that. But all of these other options, and that's the unfortunate part, a lot of these have been one-time grants, and those grants are no more. So how do we figure out how to maximize, and that's what this study is for, because now if we have the information as far as health is concerned, because we didn't have that prior to, how do we relate health, being outdoors, into this space for us to go out for those health-related grants, for us to go out for all of these other things that we know can benefit this particular space. So if you haven't been there individually as us council members, I please encourage you to go, do something. And just stand outside if you have to. Park your car, go see the, the fireworks. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We do have a couple of residents who signed up to speak on items under the consent docket, not these items that we were just talking about. But um, Joy Reardon uh, wishes, nope, waves, okay. Uh, and Michael Washington wishes to speak about I, item 9CC. Oh, okay. Well, then we are ready for a vote. Uh, that was the end of pres scheduled presentations on the consent docket. The council wishes to make a motion. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay, concurrence docket. We have uh, merely items A and B today, which we can take, which we can take with one motion. There's a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, item 11, items requiring separate votes. We have 11A, this is an ordinance on final hearing. It was recommended for approval. Uh, it's 14624 Southeast 104th Street, going from AA to RA. Uh, this has been deferred three times. Councilman Stone. <laughs> Did anyone sign up to speak on this? No, item? so you must have outlasted him, I guess. Uh, well, 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 Joy, did you wish to speak on, okay. Unfortunately, I'm going to make a motion that we defer this item to May 10th. Okay. I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, we're, we're still working on it. Okay, fair enough. We've got a motion to defer to May 10th. That is, a, I assume that's a meeting date, I guess. Yeah. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, 11B, this is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval at 300 West Britain Road, going from R1 to Neighborhood Business District. Councilman Cooper, no one has signed up to speak. And yet, is there anyone here representing this project? Well, come on up. Hi there, good morning. Tell Morning. us a little bit about what we're uh, encountering here, friend. I'm Mark Zidzow with Johnson & Associates, address is 1 East Sheridan Avenue. Uh, this is a, actually a windowless concrete building that has been there for many, many years. It was owned R1 single family. It was recently acquired uh, by the glass company that has a, 
establish a presence in the Britain District. Uh, there's no plans for it right now, uh, but the zoning was not in compliance with uh, the commercial building, so this was just bring it up for development possibilities to occur. That's great. Um, I'm very excited about some placemaking and street enhancement improvements coming, so I'll be curious what imagination comes from the private sector. So with that, I'll move for approval. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, item C was previously deferred, so we're at item D. This is an ordinance on final hearing. That was recommended for approval at 11130 North Council Road, going from PUD 1388 to PUD 1881. Councilman Carter. Anyone signed up? No, sir. I move for approval. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 11E is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval at 1000 Northwest 50th Street going from SPUD 662 to SPUD 1367. This has been deferred a couple of times. Councilman Cooper, no one has signed up to speak. And yet we have representation for the applicant. We're gonna get those steps in today, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Should move up to the front. Uh, Mark Zitzel with Johnson & Associates, 20 Sheridan Avenue. Uh, this was previously deferred uh, so we could meet with the neighbors. Uh, we are proposing uh, different commercial uses. This was previously attractive land that was zoned by Chesapeake for a CNG fueling station. Uh, there's an out parcel that's left to be developed. Uh, and there are different options that are being discussed. Uh, there's a new site plan that was submitted uh, with the SPUD. We submitted a revised SPUD last week with changes uh, that came out of discussions with the neighborhood. Uh, the biggest one being removing a speaker box from the development, so it would be a pickup only window, uh, in addition to uh, potential of a sound wall or increasing the height of the wall to uh, mitigate any potential noise from what may be a drive through. It's not been determined at this point. At this point. So uh, with that, happy to answer any questions. City Clerk, is there anything in particular we need to do with this item in terms of the voting this morning? Yes, somebody needs to present the amendment, so. Wow. Oh, okay, so what do we have now? We have an amendment to this item? Y yes, and that's <laughs> the things that Mark just mentioned. Do I need to do, and that's just the items you just described, like the, 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 the oh, everything you just said with the wall and not having the, the drive-through, but the walk-up and these things, right? Right, so there was uh, an SPUD document that was resubmitted uh, on April 7th that outlined all of the, the revisions. Okay. And so it's my understanding that it could be moved that the document received April 7th Got it. Okay. Uh, would be what was approved. So that's what you would like. So that's yeah. what I'd like to vote to amend this for us to receive. You that. move to amend the SPUD as defined in the April 7th document. Correct, that is what I do, Mayor. Okay. Again, do you need to say something? <clears throat> I was just going to say, JJ. Oh, good lord! Do you have that document? You have those it's amendments. Yes, it's all been submitted. Okay, to the great. Clerk's office so, as well. you just need to move to adopt the amendments. What basically what you said? Yeah, adopt the amendments. Do. Okay. Yeah. Do I need to say it again? No, you're please? good. Let's okay. just do it virtually now. Thanks, Kenny. All right, we have a motion and a second for the amendment. Cast your votes. Uh, Councilman Stonecipher, have you had the chance to vote? Can't vote. How would you like to vote? Yes, please. Okay. All right, passes unanimously. Now we are on the SPUD as amended. Would you like to move that, Councilman Cooper? Yes, and as I do that, I just want to say thanks to Mark and the neighbors and to Board 2 Commissioner Janice Powers for your work on all of this. I really appreciate your time and collaboration. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. 
passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item F has been previously deferred, so we are at item G. This is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval at 1801 South Jordan Avenue going from R1, I1, and AE2 to SPUD 1379. Councilman Stone, no one has signed up to speak. Thank you, Mayor. This is a item that was recommended for approval by the uh, Planning Commission. Unless anyone has any questions, I'd go ahead and move for approval. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item H, ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval at 10800 Northwestern Avenue going from C3 to SPUD 1381. Councilwoman Nice, no one has signed up to speak. Yes, I, I did speak to the applicant and I am going to ask that we defer this for two weeks. Okay. We have a motion to defer this item to our meeting in two weeks. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, item I. This is an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval at 1612 uh, South Check Hall Road, going from C3 to SPUD 1382. Councilwoman Young. I don't think Thank you, Mayor. Has anyone signed up no, to speak? No, they have not. All right. With the uh, recommendation from Planning Commission with the summary of technical evaluations included, I'll move for approval. All right. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, 11J, this is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval at 4641 Northwest 63rd, going from SPUD 1240 to SPUD 1383. Uh, Councilman Cooper, no one has signed up to speak. But representation for the applicant is here, and since this is an item um, where the new Ward 2 boundaries have brought in this area, I think it might be worth us taking time to hear a little bit about um, this uh, this zoning proposal. Yeah, David Box 522 Colcord Drive. I had the opportunity to uh, waste Councilman Carter's time explaining all of the effort that was made when this was in Ward 1 at Planning Commission. Uh, perhaps the benefit of the project is the Ward 1 Planning Commission member is a landscape architect. So at the time, he put some requirements within the SPUD to require additional landscaping surrounding the tract uh, that now finds itself in Ward 2. And uh, so I then called Councilperson Cooper. So this is a, an SPUD that would allow a personal storage facility. It is right now zoned in an SPUD that would allow a multifamily development. We had a, a Zoom meeting last week with two separate neighborhood groups. One is uh, the Rolling Wood neighborhood, which is south of 63rd Street. And the other neighborhood group, his name escapes me, but it is the neighborhood that is um, on the north, the east, and the west side of this. They were pleased to, to see the landscaping and pleased to see that the uh, ability to have this developed as multifamily would be gone. So they indicated their support. Again, it did receive a uh, recommendation for approval by Planning Commission with the amendments that you see within the, the staff memo before you. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Councilman Carter, was there anything you learned from that as someone <laughs> who previously represented this area that I should be made aware of before I say yay or nay? The neighborhoods are actually pretty excited about getting the, <laughs> this developed in that sense. And, and to all fairness to Mr. Box, I let him talk the entire time before I corrected him. Just <laughs> I think I wasted his time more than anything. <laughs> but we were, we were going to move for approval at this point before it, it switched wards. So. Uh, well, uh, thank you for that. And the only other things I would add is Lakeview is the name of that neighborhood. Just wanted to verify that. Also, Casa Perico is right down the street from this. And if y'all have not been to this delicious restaurant, I am telling you it is a gem. Yeah, good, good, good. I'm seeing some nodding heads. I, I, I cannot, I'm so honored to represent this area. And with that, I'll move for approval. And they did not sponsor. No, 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 no. Casa Perica had nothing to do with it. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, 
cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. All right, 11K, ordinance on final hearing, recommended for approval at 4301 Southeast 118th Street, going from SPUD 851 to SPUD 1384. And Councilman Stone, the applicant, uh, Corey Voigt, has signed up to speak. here in case someone has a question. I mean, I'm just wanting to build my house. Yeah, I get it. I totally get it. Uh, this bud change is just to allow for a little, little bit larger square footage on the house. Recommended for approval with the Planning Commission. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and move it for approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thanks, Corey. Thank y'all very much. All right, uh, item 11L was previously deferred, so we're at 11M. This is an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval. Changing the names of, and this is probably why they're changing them, I don't know how to pronounce uh, these, pre these existing names, but we're going to Burgundy East, Burgundy West, and Burgundy Drive. Councilman Stonecipher. Burgonia. I <laughs> looked it up, and it is a French grape. More specifically, it is a Pinot Noir. And uh, it is in the region of Burgundy, and what I've been told is that they changed to Burgundy, Burgundy because it's easier to pronounce. <laughs> I move for approval. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 11 in ordinance on final hearing uh, that was recommended for approval to close all of the east-west alley of block one of the Uffield edition, east of South Classen and south of Southwest 5th. Councilwoman Hammond. Yes, um, Planning Commission uh, recommended approval, so I will move for approval. Okay. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Councilman Greenwell, or have you had the chance to vote? Thank you. Passes unanimously. Okay, 11 0. This is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval to close the east 375 feet of the east west alley and block two of the Hearst edition east of North Santa Fe and south of Northeast 38th. Councilwoman Nice. Yes, um, to, to my knowledge, this is to continue to um, keep this development and develop a, a warehouse area for the industrial area of I-2. So I will move for the approval. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, now we're on item P. This is a public hearing uh, regarding the proposed ordinance change relating to massage. This was presented at the last meeting Still has final consideration at our next meeting today. It's just the public hearing. Amy, has anyone signed up to speak? No, they haven't. All right, we'll close the public hearing and move on to item Q. This is a public hearing uh, regarding a proposed ordinance change relating to the collection of collision reports. And this was also presented at the last meeting. Uh, upcoming vote at the next meeting today is just the public hearing. Amy, has anyone signed up to speak? No, they haven't. They have not. So we will close the public hearing and enter item R, the public hearing regarding proposed changes to the water fees. This was also presented at our last meeting, has a future vote at our next meeting. Amy, did anyone sign up to speak? No, they haven't. They did not. And so we will close that public hearing uh, and move on to 11S1. This is a public hearing regarding the dilapidated structures here listed. Uh, did anyone sign up to speak on this? No, they haven't. So uh, we, Mayor, oh, oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, go. Councilwoman Nice. Thank you. Um, uh, for Item F, if you don't mind entertaining me, I would like to defer that two weeks. Which, um, which one? F, as in Frank. Oh, got it. And I know there has been some, some movement, and unfortunately, there has we haven't been able to, to my knowledge of what I received, we haven't been able to get any 
response from OG&E as far as assistance with lighting in the area, and we've been asking for that for quite some time in this particular um, space. And also, it seems as if we're still, people, as soon as they do a little bit, get a little headway that someone is coming and it gets vandalized or moved again. So that's the unfortunate part about what's happening here. So if you'll allow me two weeks, we'll figure it out. Certainly, Councilman Stone, is yours a deferral as well? No. Okay, all right, then let's take this motion. Mine is. Well, hold on then, we'll take this motion. Still, I was gonna group them together. On that was. deferral, yes. <laughs> uh, let's do this deferral real quick. We have a motion and a second for deferral of 11S1F. Passes unanimously, item is deferred two weeks. All right, Councilman Stone. And items D and E, those are previously deferred. I was just hoping we could, I could see the pictures on those. Item E. Hmm. All right, thank you. You wish to? No, I'll go ahead and... You're good? Okay. I'm good, thank you. All right, then. Then, with no further comments, we'll move on to 11S2, the resolution declaring that the structures are dilapidated, except for the, that one previously deferred. I have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, 11T1 is a public hearing regarding the unsecured structures here listed, except for those struck at the beginning of the meeting. Amy, has anyone signed up to speak? No, they haven't. And okay. Mayor, yes. item L is also from the pre previous, so okay. I'd like to defer that for two weeks, please. Okay. All right, we've got a motion and a second to defer item 11T1L. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, no other comments. We'll move to T2, the, the resolution declaring that the structures are unsecured except for those previously deferred or struck. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 11, U1 is a public hearing regarding the abandoned buildings here listed, except for those struck at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, Amy, has anyone signed up to speak under this public hearing? No, they haven't. They have not, and so we will advance to 11, U2, a resolution declaring that the buildings are abandoned, except for those previously struck. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, 11 V1 is a public hearing regarding a joint resolution with the Oklahoma City Economic Development Trust approving the allocation of general obligation limited tax bond proceeds and or investment proceeds in an amount not to exceed $1,250,000. Um, and then we have a joint resolution uh, relating to that as well. I don't believe we have any presentation because it's already been presented. Has anyone signed up on the public hearing? Uh, yes, Joy Reardon, come forward. Let me use this one over here. That's fine. Um, I thought that housing would at least come up and explain some things from the last meeting. Um, and I still have the same question as I did last, the last meeting. Um, about, and I did find what I was talking about the last meeting. It was November 5th, 2019, that uh, Mr. Ian, which is sitting in the gallery, 
uh, come to y'all to get it all rezoned. We, we would like to, uh, me and several residents and everything at our buildings and several other buildings, would like to get some kind of update on both the project that's on the docket today and also our building. If we could get some help with that, it would be appreciated. I'll just let you know, um, I did speak with Ian and, and Mark yesterday, and they did provide some updates, so I did ask them to make sure that they got that along to you all. If it, however that makes works best for you all, whether that's a written notice or a meeting of some kind, um, they are, since they're here, maybe you can connect with them after the meeting and we can get something figured out. So. Yeah, it's, this has been being drug out since uh, 2019. And Miss Nice, the uh, video that you showed last time was actually shown at one of the council meetings two weeks prior to the rezoning. To give you a timeline. And the rezoning happened, uh, I watched hours and hours of uh, city council meeting and it was done on November 5th, 2019. So. There were supposed to be several other residents from our building to speak on behalf, but I guess they never showed up. So that's all okay. I had. Thank, Thank you. Joy. Appreciate y'all's time. Okay. Uh, Joy was the only person to sign up under the public hearing, so we're on. Well, I have, I have comments. I guess sure. I can make them in this sure. public hearing too. And I think that's the unfortunate part to the point of, of what Ms. Joyce said, that one, uh, we have residents that, that are tenants that have to work and or they are in some ways fearful to, to say what is happening to them uh, for their vouchers to be revoked, um, which clearly, you know, can't do that, but it happens. So that, that's also a concern. And it's, it's also unfortunate how um, an article that was written in the Oklahoma did not highlight and focus on what the problem is at hand. And it is the fact that there was lack of communication in the middle of this process. It just happened the way that it happened. And there was one brave soul that I, I would like to thank that commented clearly about everything that took place and what happened to them. And I will quote from that letter. As of April 5th, there was still one tenant left. She had three extended deadline dates due to her not being able to find a home. She is disabled and does not have an income. This was by far one of the worst experiences of my life. OCHA did not properly handle the relocation of their residents. Children had, children had to relocate during the school year and change schools. The MLK office staff never had answers. Residents became frustrated. And next year there's another relocation. And I do hope they are more prepared to assist with helping them to find new housing and explaining to them the stipulation of receiving their HUD voucher. The entire process was not thoroughly executed. And again, that is the unfortunate part of how this looks, the perception of this. And in my opinion, this is what gentrification looks like. And this being and happening with what our tenants this is someone that, that wants to speak. I believe we have a, a resident that would like to speak. I, I said, what's going is on? Is that what, I don't know, <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, maybe Craig, not. Craig, what, can you help maybe us that. what's going on? And that's fine. I'm not sure what I would just hear from Oh, okay, okay. 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 All right, so again, as we, Okay, he, he's, established, he's figuring out which item he wants to speak on. Okay. All right, I don't, we don't know that it's this one. Okay, thank you, Councilwoman Nice, I'm sorry. Are you, are you 
concluded? Um, for, that's really all the main pieces of this I had. And again, it's, it's quite unfortunate that the, the article that was produced yesterday did not give the exact highlights of, of what the, the problems have been for the residents here. So uh, again, I, I'm still not supporting this because of how my tenants were treated. Mor morally, this was not right for them to have been uh, treated in this manner. Um, and I am going to continue to work through this to make sure this does not happen to any other residents if I can help that. Okay. So, can, yes. Can I ask one question on that? Uh huh. And I totally get your points, Councilwoman Knight. Is it a is it a benefit to them to kill this project? I'm I'm, I'm just I'm trying to understand because I I totally get your points and under, I mean I get it. But like, as far as moving forward. We still want this project to move forward, don't we, for low-income housing, or no? The project itself, as presented, is not what we're getting, and that's, the, that's, that's what I have a problem with. And again, as I, I look at what has taken place and, and how this process has taken place, and the fact that we're already looking at how gentrification has impacted this part of our community, and for this to now prove how this is moving and going to impact this community, I have difficulty with supporting it. That's just me. That is, that's my view. Um, and for the residents that I have to talk to every single day that see how gentrification has been impacting particular areas of, of this same community. And for this to happen in the manner that it did, again, it, it, it's hard for me to support that to say, yes, this is actually going to benefit all of the people who want to be a part of this because I, I don't see that happening. That's, but again, that is my opinion and that is the opinion that I continue to talk with residents through and that's the, again, the unfortunate part that we have residents that are fearful to speak out and, and I get it, mm -hmm. I, trust me, I get it and I do not want them to risk anything that they have um, in order for them to have shelter. That, that's one thing I will not do. But I, as long as I'm here, that's the one thing I can stand here and boldly say, um, I'm going, that's the, I will not support something of that magnitude that's going to impact my community in this manner. Whether you say it's gonna benefit them or not, we have seen that clearly what your approach is is not to benefit them. So again, that's, that's how I feel about that. And with the residents that I have personally spoken with. Got it, thank you. I guess, Todd, just to add on to what you said, you know, we have $10 million that's been uh, set aside for affordable housing, and um, that's because of a bond issuance. And the question becomes, is there, a, we, we, we've been looking at this since September, and the question becomes is, is there now such a funding gap uh, that you question whether this project is financially feasible? And uh, that's what's kind of going on in my mind. And I would like to see affordable housing move forward. Uh, we've looked at this for a long time, but I keep worrying about, and, and you're more aware of this and attuned to it than I am, is building materials keep going up each week and we're not gonna see them going down. And so uh, if we head down this road with this project, um, will it be revisited within the next six months, the next year, uh, to deal with additional funding gaps? And I don't know the answer to that. Maybe somebody does. Maybe you can come on, comment on that, city manager. Well, I, I, I mean, as far as like the project's feasibility going forward, like can it go forward with this? And I think right now that Housing Authority believes that it can. It's, I mean, as you said, it's, it's really the most significant investment that we've made in affordable housing in many, many years. As far as the number of units that are truly affordable housing that this will generate, I think delaying this or moving, you know, delaying this further, I think would have a negative impact. Yeah. And, and let's continue to talk through what affordable housing looks like. I think that's in the, in the eye of, of who, who speaks to it. And the fact that even in this newspaper article, it explained what 
we're looking at as far as monthly incomes. And um, quite frankly, it doesn't matter what happens, we need to make sure people can afford to live there, even if they have a voucher. And it doesn't seem as if, as we're working on workforce housing, as we're working on all of these other types of housing, that it's going to be in a way that people can afford to live there. So what does, what does it mean for people to, res to build all of these things and people can't afford to even stay? That's a problem when we talk about what affordable housing looks like and the fact that we have an entity that is already showing that they really just want to do what they want to do and the residents can find a voucher or not. We'll try to house them, we'll say we're housing them and move them in the middle of the school year, in the middle of a pandemic and it's on them. So that, those are unfortunate things and I, I think as we look at what affordable housing is supposed to look like, we also have to be careful how we protect our residents in that process because this could go very well or this could be a sinking ship in the same, in the same lens of who is going to be the person that says they will be doing affordable housing in these communities. And as we look at even the senior center that is on um, 122nd and Western that has been built, they're still doing that in, in these phases. It, you know, it's, it's also trying to make sure people, I don't even know if it's fully occupied. So we have to, those are, those are concerns and those are things that I, that I also have to, to look at as we're going through this process. So again, that's, that's how I feel about this and, and that's what I'm gonna stick to as I, as I have heard from the residents and they have not been afraid to talk to me. However, I, I can't protect them in the open because they, they want to keep that privacy and I respect that. Councilwoman, <clears throat> um, I just tried to look up the Oklahoman article but it's behind a firewall. What are the incomes what, that they said for this project? Oh, you, do you have it? A one bedroom, $824 to $1,099. Two bedrooms, $988 to $1,318. Three bedroom, $1,142 to $1,523. And four bedroom, all four beds are going to have housing vouchers. So that kind of reminds me of, of one that we just, we just looked at um, in the community right downtown as far as what affordable and workforce housing is supposed to look like and be defined as, and it does not do such uh, as far as that income guideline is concerned. So it is what it is, but at the same time, again, as I've said, that's, that's not something that I will openly support as far as looking at how this is gentrifying the, the community. The one thing I'd say, James, and, and I've been working on affordable housing since the early 90s uh, for a couple of clients, and uh, I'm going to need that in just a second. But um, it, the question becomes, uh, if you want to build affordable housing, you've got to attract people that are going to build it. And, and I don't care whether that's a governmental agency at the local level, the state level, the federal level, or a private developer. And what all those entities, whether public or private, what they look at is, you know, what, what is the cap rate? What is going to be the return on investment? And that's where we, where we, we run into problems because with affordable housing, uh, the cap rates are low, the return on uh, an investment is low, and then people don't want to build. And so we need to come up with something that addresses what, what Nikki's saying, but we also need to come up with something that makes it feasible, financially feasible, for people to build these facilities. And that's what I think we're wrestling with right now as a council, how to come up with that right mix. The, I appreciate that context. With the, with the voucher, so this 824, are we talking, this is a mixed um, income? So in other words, would I be able to use a public voucher to live there to free or reduce cost? Meanwhile, someone else pays a market rate for this one bedroom, is that, am I understanding this setup correctly? I, I think that's an important question. Mark, you may be better. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say it'd be helpful to have the particulars for. <laughs> The, the other thing while he's walking up here, and, and I, I don't know about this, and Nikki knows a lot more about it than me, but in reading Ramona Lewis's comments, 60 years of age, she says the units are fraught with issues, including rotting floors, bad insulation, and pest problems. Um, she really wants this project to go through because it's overdue and needed in, in the area because of these, because of these units uh, that we live in currently are so old. Um, they need to be gone, they need to be bulldozed because it's that bad. I don't know if that's the way the majority of people feel or not, but that's one comment that was in, uh, in the Daily Oklahoman where Ms. Lewis was quoted. She chose not to move into the new facility uh, because she smokes and, and, and wanted to go somewhere else where she could continue to smoke. And, and to respond to that, I, I think it's also clear for us to, to understand, yes, this whole area has infrastructure issues that need to be addressed because of the fact of what has taken place historically and systemically in particular areas of our community, especially this area. So let me, let me just say, first and foremost, everyone deserves adequate housing. The question is, at what cost? At what cost does do people deserve that same adequate housing? And that's the unfortunate part, is it, was, it, it, it has been to the point, as, as I read and continue to read, that they would barely fix things because they wanted people to, to go, to force them out in, in ways, if you will. Then, therefore, people are now saying, yes, yes, you, have a, you can come back if you like. But those first same folks, most of them are saying, no, I don't want to come back. Yeah, why would they say yes? If you're getting these types of conditions intentionally that we aren't addressing, and you say, well, we'll bring you back. Wait, wait for it. There was a, a whole gap from 19, 2019 to 2021 where this could have been moving forward because we approved this in 2019 where they could have started building already if that was the case for us to move those residents to show that we are wanting to make sure you have good, adequate housing. It was to the point one time where the water was shut off when we were trying to figure out what was going on. Again, when we look at the senior centers, I have problems and issues trying to figure out what's going on. We have other scattered sites that we're still trying to figure out what's going on. And again, the unfortunate part is you have residents that because they are, they don't know all of their empowerment, not to say they aren't empowered, but they don't know all of their empowerment, that they choose to say, this is, what I, this is what I have, so I'm going to make the best of what I have in this situation because this is a roof over my head. I say, you know, when we're giving money to things like that, I, that just, that bothers me. So again, that's, that's where I feel and that's how I feel and, and to read and look at all of these things that people have been subjected to, that is very unfortunate for the Oklahoma City Housing Authority to, to say they are responsible or not take responsibility for whichever it is. Would you like to me to speak for the rents? Yes. Hi, Ian Colgan, Assistant Executive Director of the Oklahoma City Housing Authority. So 40% of the project in each phase is represented by project-based Section 8 vouchers. That's the replacement housing for the existing public housing that exists. Typically, that serves uh, households at 50% or below of area median income. In effect, you can make nothing all the way up to 50% of area median income. Whatever your portion of adjusted gross income is equals your portion of tenant paid rent, and then uh, HUD provides a subsidy for the balance. The uh, rents quoted in the paper are the mixed income portion, where we go up to 60, 70, and 80% of area median income, attempting not to replicate just public housing on a site, but an integrated mixed income project. Those rents are set by the federal government and the housing, uh, Oklahoma Housing Finance Agency. So if you look up those rents, they will match exactly what the rents are allowable between those income bands. Do you have any other questions about the rents? Thank you. Um, I think I'd like to make some comments because I think 
I, I think some of the, some things that have already been said very much dovetail with things that I've been thinking about throughout this process. Um, that part of what we're confronted with having to reckon with is a systemic long time disinvestment in housing as a right. And instead we've invested it ha as housing as a commodity. So when a developer comes and they want TIF funds to, to cover gap funding, but there's, we, we provide no requirements that, that they should have mixed income, true mixed income, affordable um, access for people uh, making less than air immediate income. Uh, we, we are perpetuating the problem of segregating parts of our community um, to, to developments that the federal government has not put any money into improving the state and our city has essentially said hands off, we're not gonna improve these properties for decades. And, um, and so I, I, I struggle with you know, reading that tenants chose to move out of the property because faced with a choice of moving to another unit a few blocks away that the water is constantly an issue, there's holes in the wall, there's bugs, rodents, et cetera, and uprooting yourself and trying to find you know, a, a unit that will take a voucher, which can be very, very difficult. Um, in theory, it, all across the community, you're supposed to be able to access housing with a voucher, but um, any person working to house someone with a voucher will tell you it can take weeks and weeks to find someone. Um, and often again, those end up being segregated into parts of the community that have difficulty accessing resources. They're um, large, you know, largely um, concentrated um, with other people accessing housing with a voucher and then again just perpetuates this issue of the, the segregation of uh, those people, if you will, people accessing vouchers when I would argue that anyone who owns a home also has subsidized governmental housing through their uh, mortgage um, tax relief, tax credit, and those of us who pay rent have no access to that relief. Um, as somebody who rents, again, that choice sometimes is a false choice. Um, it's, we're not providing true options to people in our community that, um, that need access to housing as a human right because, when develop, again, when developers come to us and say, well, I still need to make 14% on my investment, so I need this gap funding um, because my investors aren't going to take the hit. Let's put the hit on the community but there's no true access for people across the community to, uh, to access that housing um, in any real way. Uh, we've now forced housing authorities, HUD, et cetera, to come up with tools to try to fit in the same model of housing as a commodity um, without making the private side maybe make some of those, uh, some of those uh, to, to bear the brunt and the, the cost of that. Um, so again, I, I think we need to be really careful when we use phrases like tenants chose to move out of the property because again, a choice between staying somewhere that is substandard and has been disinvested in and forgotten by leaders in our community for decades when we put all of our money and priorities elsewhere um, is not, it's not a real choice. It's, it's not a good choice for people. Um, we've, not, we've not provided people real choices. And I think, especially as we talk about MAPS 4 funds going forwards with this affordable housing, and I said it when we voted on uh, sending that package to the voters, I'm afraid that we're really gonna be let down, um, that this is not, you know, we brand it with this promise of, um, of creating all these new units when uh, we, we're not tackling the root causes, and that is that we treat housing as a commodity, we treat housing as though it's an investment and not a human right. Um, I hate that we're trapped in that system, that 
addressing those, that root cause is gonna take a huge cultural and paradigm shift that we cannot fix, we're not gonna have today, but I do feel the need to say that out loud because I think that's the core of what, because like this uh, issue did not arise when the housing authority asked us for this gap funding. This has been a decades long problem that um, now is sort of becoming a priority for governments to try to address, um, but not, we're just chipping away. Um, and, and then that leads to, I, I can see these dynamics of people feeling like they're doing their best, going above and beyond in, in trying to provide this type of housing, um, but missing the mark because we're trapped in a system that is not that is more about making sure that people uh, can make some money rather than actually providing people places to live. Um, so I don't think there are easy answers. I really um, commend Councilman you for advocating for this and bringing this to light because I think it is, again, as we move forward with all of these other types of funding puzzles that um, we, we force developers, uh, especially of affordable housing, to try to navigate. Um, I, I fear this is not, unless we say and set the standard of what community engagement, um, you know, resident uh, empowerment um, and that trust, because the power dynamic between a housing provider and a tenant is not equal. <laughs> I will say that as somebody who rents is that you know, it is uh, much easier for my landlord to kick me out of uh, my apartment than it is for me to um, make sure that my rights are protected, just legally. So when you're, again, in a position where, whether it's true or not in the real, in the world, in, the, in what might happen, the sense that you are at risk of losing access to your housing, becoming a quote unquote problem tenant, et cetera, is very real. <laughs> And, um, and when you're in that additional layer of, again, hearing from some of the difficulties that tenants have experienced at this particular property, um, you know, the choice, quote unquote, to just leave and separate yourself from that um, is probably, again, I don't think it's a real choice. Even if you're not coercing someone to leave, I think we need to, make sure that we're recognizing those dynamics and being really humble as we approach these, these sorts of projects because um, if I put myself in the shoes of someone in this, um, that's lived in this development for years and years and years, um, I wouldn't, you know, I think, I think that's what we need to constantly be doing is putting ourselves in those shoes um, and listening to the issues that they're experiencing um, because without doing that, we're, we're going to, that trust will never be re, uh, or not even re, just established, <laughs> um, quite honestly. Um, and again, um, I think we really need to reckon with um, how we do other housing development so that it isn't just one entity or a handful of entities that do quote unquote affordable housing development um, that are having to, um, bear the brunt of these systemic issues um, because that does a disservice um, to growing true prosperity for people in our community. Um, so I don't have an easy answer. I don't think any of us do, but um, that I did. I just I felt like I needed to say that um, because I think there is there are. I think there are issues with how this was approached, but I think there's also a deeper level of systemic um, problems that we need to be addressing as, a, as leaders in this community, in this city, um, that, that we need to really reckon with. Okay, any other comments? Yep. So if we don't improve this and move this forward, what is the answer? I mean, they're living in a, in a place that's deplorable currently from the article that we read, the floors, the housing, the walls. If they're we, already gone. Most okay. of them are gone already, so they've been removed. 
but for the ones that aren't, that are waiting for homes or waiting for a, a building to be built, if we don't do something, are we making the situation worse by perpetuating this? I, I think that's what the point was just made as far as how difficult this, this type of decision is because now your, your hands are tied where you, you literally have to say, well, let them build it because we've, we've made it to where no one can stay here. They can't live here and we have not invested even our, enough of our funds to help keep this in the, in the way that people can live. So in livable conditions. It? Could we amend this or add something to where there's a, like some oversight or there's continual coming back to us and reporting you know, every step of the way how things are going and how many people we've moved in, what vouchers we've been given, things to that degree so we can kind of keep an eye on this one this time instead of repeating what it's been done in the past? Um, assuming that can be done, I'm wondering what our municipal counselor would say pertaining to this. The question is, can we amend it, uh, what's proposed at this point, so periodically we can have reports. We set at three months, at six months, at whatever everybody feels comfortable for, and moving the project forward and making sure we have additional oversight on that, and I think it can be amended to do that. Yes. You could come back with the economic development agreement and we could potentially put some language in there. So this, this allocates the funding for the project. We'll know. come back, we'll follow up with any, this doesn't get details of actually what's provided in the project. I mean, it's the funding for the project, but we'll come back with an economic development agreement. Yeah, I, I know that's ultimately gonna come back, but we, we need to make sure that um, if Nikki's gonna support this, the, the motion is amended to state uh, that we will have periodic reporting with whatever she's comfortable with. I think you're talking about probably putting a, some language in the resolution, right? Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. I said that, I said motion, I meant resolution. I'm sorry. And the economic development agreement will go to the economic development trust and come back here for concurrence, is that right? Okay. Yeah, I, I mean. Well, I will, if we move this forward, I also have a couple other caveats that I would like to add to this. If, you, you can, if you do want to amend that to put this in the resolution before you, you probably ought to summarize what Mark as a motion and have it to amend the resolution. Good for you. And yeah, then you I can agree. vote on that and we'll, we can d develop the specific language that sure. accomplishes that. That will go on the agreement itself, but right. I get it. Um, with with this with this resolution as well, what I would like to do because uh, this board was established by resolution, the Oklahoma City Housing Authority. I would like to also um, amend. In I'm saying this now, for us to amend that resolution and add uh, actual council members or other appointees to be a part of that particular board. Um, in order for us to also have that type of oversight on this type of, on, on this, on this, in this situation. Well, I mean, you can't do this, the resolution, you can't It's not associated with this. So I think it would be a different. They're telling me that's a different. I, well, I, mean, I no, just said you. that. I'm asking. I, mean. I just said, <laughs> yes, yes I just said it was different in order for that to happen. But may I make a recommendation with that? Is when this comes, when this item comes back, could it not come back at the same time that there is a resolution amending the makeup of the, um, the, the board? And again, I believe at the start of this, um, it's an interesting idea because I believe at the start of this meeting, um, you know, our MAPS 3 has council members, MAPS 4 has council members on there. Like we have, you're on the economic line, like we have these moments where a council person serves to provide that kind of connectivity. In fact, I believe Councilman Greenwell earlier asked for the river, um, I can't finish the rest of that word, riverfront, <laughs> river sport, <laughs> um, that there be someone, you know, and we already have someone from both finance and Council, but I think if you brought them together at the same time, then you would have both this kind of new measure of oversight and an uh, accountability and trust building. The, Councilman? Uh, yeah, I, th I think this is a new subject matter, and um, we would have to give notice 
to our citizens. Yeah, that I, I think he's saying thing. at a future day, bring a new resolution that's separate from this that would change the makeup of the Oklahoma City Housing Act. Yes, that's, that's that what I'm trying to say too. Yeah. That, that's what would have to be done. That's what I'm saying. Like bring it all, bring this back and bring that recommendation and do them like, again, separately, but on the same, in the same council meeting. So right. you're just addressing the, all of this at once. The, the, the only objection I have to that, either we, we, either we need to just vote this down and move on to something else or we need to move it forward. And, and the reason that we need to move it forward uh, as quickly as possible is because building cost of materials are going up daily and that's gonna make a bigger funding gap. And so each week, each month, we wait, we have a bigger funding gap and that doesn't make the, the project feasible. And so what, what I think uh, Bradley's suggesting is that we, we move this forward with a proposal, an amendment that would say, we are gonna periodically, whatever Nikki's comfortable with, every two months, every three months, every four months, every six months, and pass this today so we can start moving towards construction. Before we get into that nitty gritty, and I hear what you're saying, you said caveats, plural, so one of them was the makeup of the board. What else do you have, Councilwoman? Uh, I would like to see that done monthly. And, and the reason I say that also uh, is because of the fact that what came in the news, if you've seen the reports of um, almost half a million dollars being swindled out of the Oklahoma City Housing Authority. So being able to um, look at what that looks like and operating in that lens is what I am concerned about as we look at that. So yes, if, if we do that monthly, that's, that is what, it's until uh, we are comfortable in also ensuring that we have a permanent person, well, I, I'm sure that probably exists, but working through how the notification for these residents um, happens and the conversations there, therefore, how that is communicated with them and um, how we move forward. So it, it's kind of, kind of difficult for me to just make all of those things right now. And, and the only reason I say that is because I haven't been a tenant and I'm sure there are some things that as a tenant, they would probably like to see as far as being able to understand what is happening around them. Um, so that's, that's the only hesitancy I have. So I hope you understand that. So I, I don't wanna make that full decision for them. What is the timeline? Because I think that what Councilman Carter I think he's right because look, like as someone, it may not be my ward, but I'm right next door and this is an issue that in so many ways finds its, it finds, we are dealing with the, with the housing crisis. I've said it so many times from this horseshoe and in my ward and in my neighborhood specifically where all these restaurants are coming back to life, all these buildings are taking place. At the same time, we are pricing out the servers, the baristas, um, the bartenders in a place that we brought back to life. This is a horrifying thing that really weighs heavily on me. So this means a lot. So I think you're, I, it's hard for me to vote no on this project because we need to do something to address what Councilman Carter, you're talking about what this news article is talking about. But vote no I will, unless we address, uh, put in some mitigating things right now that can help make a dent in these systemic decades long, decades long issues. We didn't get here overnight. So I think, what is it, two weeks? I mean, Kenny, help us out here. I, and I hear your concern about the every day, but I'm telling you, if this has been going on, this has not been renovated since the 1940s, Councilman, 1940s. Am I wrong? 1945. Thank you, 1945. What is two weeks? What is four weeks we to keep get doing it right? It. We keep kicking the can down the road. And Two so, or four weeks. so what, what my plan is, is to move to amend it and have the monthly reporting that Nikki wants, or I'm gonna vote against it. And, and we'll wait for another project when we, we can come together. That is your prerogative. But the missing piece that I just heard her say was that community communication. And if within that two weeks, and again, I'm just making up two weeks. I don't Kenny would have to tell us what a realistic framework is. But within that framework, there can be communication with the rep the elect do the representative who was elected to represent her people. If she can have that time to go figure out what would 
an amended communication look like going forward, then your legacy councilman, her legacy and the legacy, I'm serious. I am serious when I use that word. The legacy of this council is that we have now provided a structure with this board and its people that it's serving out there going forward. And I just think, again, as a lawyer and as a lawyer, you all would want that sort of um, wording to get it right. Am I, I don't think this is an unreasonable thing. And if we all vote no, which again, I'm inclined to do right now as well, but if we all vote no, then Creston Hills is gonna remain Creston Hills. And that's not right for those people. It's, that's not right. That's not right. And I worry that if we all vote no, then when will we ever get a chance to do something like this again? So Kenny, what is a good timeline? Two weeks. How about that? Who knew? Um, so again, I just hope a majority of the council can actually get to a better place. And by the way, what I also like about today is this is one of the first times I have served in three years where we've actually all, almost all of us have added an opinion on this. And a council really should be a discussion like a classroom instead of us all just like, you know, sitting here. So I really appreciate that everyone has added to this today. I, I think it's cool. Okay, so is anyone gonna make a motion to do something? <laughs> do it deferred for two weeks? Kenny, what would it look like to get to this amended place and to bring back this resolution that changes the makeup of the board just with adding a counselor? Since, since we're making this up as we go along, I'll have, we'll we have though? to look at Aren't it. We? <laughs> we'll have to take a look at it and get, get back with you. We will, but two weeks can... We can do it. Let's right. move mountains. All, yeah. all right. So okay. So the, we'll we'll take them in this sequence. Uh, motion to defer. If that fails, then we'll consider a motion to amend, and so on from there. If motion to defer passes, obviously, then we'll defer. So why don't we, uh, James? You wish to make mm -hmm. a motion to defer? I said it, but there's a computer staring back at me. It's blank. Go verbal. All right, so we have uh, Councilman Cooper, you have a motion to defer two weeks. Yes, please, Your Honor. Is there Honor. a second? A second. All right, uh, clerk, please call the roll. Councilperson Carter? Yes. Councilperson Cooper? Yes. Councilperson Stone? No. Councilperson Greenwell? Yes. Councilperson Hammond? Councilperson Nice? Yes. Councilperson Stone Cipher? Nay. Mayor Holt? Nay. Did you keep track? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's the count? <laughs> Three. Three nays. With two, two? Five to three. Five to three? Yep. Okay. All right, so deferral motion passes five to three. Uh, we are, of course, talking about item 11 v 2 that item is now deferred to our next meeting okay 11 w1 is a public hearing um, regarding the amendment of the june 22nd 2021 resolution approving certain fire listed and other sales tax expenditures um, amy has anyone signed up to speak under this public hearing no. no okay. No. We do have a resolution and a presentation on that resolution. Doug, so. give a real quick update on these projects. This is with our fire sales tax resolution and the requirement to update these to align with the budget. Doug Dowler, budget director for the city. As we spoke about earlier, we're amending the sales tax resolution or the sales tax funds for the increased uh, tax revenue that we've received this year. Fire would also like to amend the resolution so that they have the authority to spend some of that money on two specific projects, firefighting tools and equipment as well as their firefighter recruit overage uh, program. Uh, without the resolution, they don't have the authority to spend that extra money. You'll notice that police does not have a resolution on today. They don't have additional projects that they feel that they need the additional authority for at this point. If something changes uh, through the year, they would come back to amend their resolution. So today we're just looking at fire sales tax fund and amending what projects or what, what they can spend their sales tax on. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. 
Any questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, we could consider the resolution found at 11W2. This is actually the uh, introduction of the resolution with final hearing on April 26th. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, now we're at 11X. This is a resolution amending the current budgeting and financial planning policies adopted on March 27, 2018. We have presentation. Yes, Brent Bryan, our finance director, will give us an update on the recommended, recommended changes for our financial planning policies. Good morning. Uh, back on February 8th at our financial workshop, we discussed some of the uh, uh, various indicators related to the financial health of the city and we, we talked about it even this morning, Craig talked about it this morning with the city manager's report, it's related to fund balance. And so why do we have all these, these funding or these, uh, the, these policies? They're critical to our strategic and resilient approach to financial management. They help us commit to find good financial practices, uh, define boundaries for staff. Uh, sustain a favorable bond rating and manage risks to financial condition. You know, in 1997, the city council adopted our first set of policies. Subsequent to that, it was amended in 2018. Uh, for the past couple of months, staff has been working with management, underwriters, financial advisors, and rating agencies, and, and what would be a good practice. And we also can looked at all the GFOA best practices when we were looking at doing these amendments to this policy. And what we're proposing to you today is, a, is increasing the operating reserve from 17 to 22 percent, uh, have that range. Uh, previously, it was 14 to 20. When you look at the best practices from GFOA, they'll say two months, which is about 16.7 percent. However, the, their policy also says you need to look at what's your situation. Well, one of the things that we've talked about here at the city is we're heavily dependent on sales and use tax. Generates approximately 71% of our income. And as we all know what happened in 2020, uh, when the, everything slowed down in March and April and May, uh, we took a big hit. And so as a result of that, we believe that we need to increase that from the 14 to 20 to the 17 to 22%. In addition to that, we'd like to request that we amend the operating reserve funds for all other funds that they have operating reserve of at least 10%. Right now the range is five to 20. We feel like we need to increase the upper, the, the lower level on that too. And what we're proposing with this policy today is a capital maintenance reserve. For anything above 22%, we would come back to this council and we would uh, transfer that, whatever the difference was between 22 or, or the, the amount above the 22, we transfer that to a capital fund to help with our facilities. Um, one of the things that the rating agencies proposed to us was, when we were talking to them about this, we went through the rating presentations with them, is they said, make sure you can utilize that for liquidity purposes too, just in case during a downturn in the economy where we could actually go back to that fund and draw and, and bring it back if we needed it for reserves. So we believe that is a, is a, is a good approach. Uh, other changes, we want to align our practices, um, the policy with our practices as as time has changed, processes have changed a little bit, and we just wanted to tweak a few things in the policy um, to follow that. And with that, I'd like to recognize Doug Dowler and Angela Pierce um, in, our, in the finance who have worked feverishly with us on this and uh, putting this together and their staff. So I want to th recognize them and thank them for their efforts on this. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Brent? Okay. Um, well, we have a resolution then uh, to approve everything that he just described. Do we have a motion from the council? Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, 11Y1 is a resolution authorizing the municipal councilor to confess judgment without admitting liability in the case of Hardlicka v. City of OKC. Executive session is not requested. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 
11Z1 is a resolution authorizing the municipal counselor to confess judgment without admitting liability. In the case of Sledge v. City of OKC, executive session is not requested. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And 11 AA is claims recommended for approval. We have items A and B. Executive session is not requested. Have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, item 12 is comments from council. Ward one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mayor. I um, just want to uh, mention that it's National Telecommunication Dispatchers Week, and we have 56 911 dispatchers in our police department. We want to give thanks for the hard work that they do. Uh, they are the first of our first responders, uh, and they do such an amazing job, and we are currently hiring right now uh, and offering a, a nice little bonus if they can get on, on the board. So. Just want to say thank you for the dispatchers and all the hard work that they do uh, every day for us. Indeed. Word for it. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to announce yet again that uh, this Thursday there will, will be a informational Turnpike Town Hall held at uh, the Rock Church, 6801 South Anderson Road from 6 to 8 p.m. OTA won't be present, uh, but we have other people there that will be able to talk different nuances about the uh, turnpike. Thank you. Thank you. Ward 6. Yeah, I just want to um, mention two events I was able to go to last week that uh, were very encouraging. And um, the first was uh, Oklahoma County Drug Court hosted a graduation. Um, typically, they graduate uh, folks out of that program um, just in the courtroom. and. Um, they, they've decided they want to have a little more fanfare around it to bring a little more attention to the, the really great successes they've had out of their program. Um, and so I just want to thank uh, Judge Stone, Kenneth Stoner for the invitation. Um, I think especially as there are discussions about um, sending a bond um, uh, proposal to Oklahoma County voters to put, and all of the conversations that I have heard about building a new jail facility um, speak to building it larger than we have now. Um, I think it's really important to look at the costs of things like drug court and other pr diversion programs from um, keeping people in our jail for a long time um, or sending them to prison in another part of the state. Um, because, you know, I think the rhetoric often is that um, people caught in the criminal legal system are there at a fault of their own um, when it's always much more complex, complex than that. And the stories of um, the three graduates that got to speak, three or four graduates that got to speak, um, speak to the trauma they've experienced throughout their lives, both um, physical and um, emotional, um, the difficulty accessing, um, you know, a, a, really good wage uh, employment and, and support from family, friends, and the community um, was a, a regular theme throughout many of their stories, um, in addition to, you know, getting into things like car wrecks and having uh, the, the uh, physical um, trauma that led to further using opiates or alcohol to, to self-medicate. And, um, and so I just, I, I encourage anyone who gets invited or hears about uh, additional, I think they're doing it twice a year right now. So in the fall, they'll have another graduation to really see um, that, you know, folks experiencing homelessness, that you see their mug shots, you see um, people on the news, um, but recognizing that um, that's often them in some of their worst moments. And um, there's so much more to uh, recovery, rehabilitation um, that, programs like drug court can offer and all of the poorly funded systems of community mental health centers and other nonprofits to support people, um, that that's where we really need to be putting our, um, our investments and not necessarily in 
larger cages for our neighbors. So um, just really encourage anyone to go, go attend those and see what's going on over there. Um, I also want to thank CARE Oklahoma um, for their um, invitation to their Ramadan iftar for elected officials. Um, it was a really lovely evening to connect with some, um, some new and old friends, I suppose. And um, again, if anyone ever has an opportunity to go to one of their, um, their events, Adam Sultani and his staff just do a really great job. And um, it's really great to see what's going on in the Muslim community. Um, especially with the pandemic the last few years and ongoing, um, you know, they've really rethought how to um, serve the community, which is always at the forefront of their conversations um, whenever, I, whenever I speak with anyone from CARE or um, any of the mosques here in, in the city. And it was just a really great event and I appreciate their invitation. So go ahead. Thank you, Ward 7. Yes, and uh, I also want to extend my gratitude to CARE Oklahoma and, and also want to congratulate Joe Beth, uh, Councilwoman Hammond, who received an award uh, for her work that she does on city council and in the community, which was a well-deserving honor. So happy to celebrate your, your award with you. And she had no idea <laughs> that she was getting that. So it was clearly a surprise to her. Um, also want to let everyone know that the James E. Stewart Golf Club is officially open. It's been open for a while though, but we had the official ribbon cutting on this past Friday and it was more of a joy to actually meet the family, uh, some of the descendants of Mr. Stewart, his grandsons and, um, and daughter, if I'm not mistaken, but being able to just say hello and, and see his legacy was the most exciting part for me to be a part of, of what that is. And if you haven't had lunch there, the lunch is really good. I had a spicy chicken sandwich and it was pretty tasty. So happy to meet anyone for lunch if you like. Um, also want to congratulate our first ever uh, jazz festival called Jazz in Bloom that took place in uh, Northeast Oklahoma City in the parking lot of the Northeast uh, Town Shopping Center. And it was a windy Saturday, but it was a good Saturday for jazz. So I wanna definitely commend Jazz and Bloom for having that event and for the people that came. I also wanna give a shout out to uh, Mr. One of the teachers that I know and um, Mr. Crawford. And he invited me for the Crowley Foundation. They had something on Saturday to engage their young men and leadership. And it was a, a great thing to see on a Saturday, just men, young men being engaged, learning uh, skills and, and just fellowshipping with each other. And, and that was really, really good to see. Um, also, we had the first Brian uh, Brockway Center Lions Luster Mansion conversation this past Saturday at the Metropolitan Library at Ralph Ellison Library. So we will be having another engagement on April 23rd. If you are available, please come out and brunch will be served from 10 until 12 at Ralph Ellison Library. And South of 8th is also happening. They're, la they're having their last engagement this Saturday. So if you can be a, a part of that, please do. And um, also want to congratulate Pivot. They have been in the community for officially 50 years this year and want to commend them for the work that they're doing, the housing that they're able to do for our, our young people that are experiencing homelessness and the tiny homes that they have been able to build that all have a different aesthetic. So um, I would encourage you all, if you have not seen just the different ways that they are able to house the young people and care for, for our young people to turn their lives around, that you just make a phone call just to see the great things that they are doing. So proud to, to be a part of, of what they're doing and them being housed in Ward 7 makes it more, more exciting. And last but not least, as I was there last night for, their, for Pivot, I had to leave because we had to invite some visitors. We have a, a visitors from Tupelo, Mississippi delegation, and it was a, a room full of folks, over, I believe, over 20. I can't remember the exact number, but 
from all across that part of, of Tupelo, Mississippi. And um, I will say, I have a new friend. His name is Gary Carnathan. And he is a, an attorney that practices for the county. And he was a joy to sit next to and just to learn more from. So I know we had a council member Carter as well as, as a council member Stonecipher present and we had a, a good just a good fellowship so glad to to greet those folks coming in and and I know they're going around today to tour our city and to see economic development and the things that we've been able to do so just happy that people want to come here and one thing that Mr. Carnathan said when he walked around he's like it's so clean down here as he walked downtown so that just speaks to uh, clearly, um, it's a, a group effort when we think about downtown OKC and all of the things that are happening around us. So just grateful that um, they are paying attention to what's happening around us and wanting to be a part and understand how they can bring it to their local areas. So thank you. Yeah, it was a great meeting last night with the, uh, the governmental folks from Tupelo. Um, very engaging, a lot of good exchange of ideas. I did learn, I don't know if you knew this, that. Uh, that's the birthplace of Elvis Presley. And, um, and it was just a wonderful evening, and I hope I get to see them before they leave. Uh, very productive. Second, um, I'm a huge fan of, of the Patients Ladding Library in Northwest Oklahoma City, right at 122nd MacArthur. It has a great inventory of resources and books and other materials. The staff is really attentive and helpful, and they have some great meeting space, and I, I want to remind people to use that. But that being said, Sunday, I went to the new Belle Isle Library, which is where I studied in high school and college. Uh, the librarians used to tell me to be quiet and shush all the time, and I've mentioned that before. But the point is, um, we should be really proud of what we did with that library. The expansion is incredible. I went all the way from the basement to the expansions to the west and, and to the south, and um, it was packed. It was electric. It was hard to find a parking space, and so. Uh, I want to commend everybody uh, that participated in that project, and uh, I want to tell uh, Councilman Cooper, uh, great job. Thank you. Okay, that concludes comments from Council, and now we're at item 13, Citizens to be Heard. We have a few who have signed up to speak. Um, Michael Washington, who is not in the room. Joy Reardon. And sir, I, if you haven't signed up to speak, just fill out a slip. Yeah, yeah. Is there someone out there to help him? Okay. Hello. Good. Um, 27 years ago, Oklahoma City stood still. If you don't know what, what it is, it's April 19th, 1995. One week from today is the anniversary. If you can... It is very touching on the, to actually be there in person for the memorial service. Most people don't know, I was one of the rescuers that ran in when everybody else was running out. Um, and like I sp spoke with uh, Mr. Freeman this morning, we are doing a lot better on ADA. There is room for improvement as every council member knows, and we discussed several areas that needs to be worked on. I will let you um, work on that. Um, the biggest thing is, and I keep coming back every council meeting for citizens to be heard, is the scooter issue. It seems like every day it gets worse, not better. And it, if we could make something to do better on this issue, it, it would help all ADA members of the um, citizens. Because people are leaving in the curb cutouts, they're leaving them in the middle of the sidewalk and stuff like that. It gets very difficult for... Um, members of the ADA community, and there's more and more ADA community every day. So, 
but I just wanted to remind y'all, uh, if you can, please try to come down on um, April 19th. It means a lot to me. Thank you. All right, Reverend Paulette Legg. Reverend Legg. Hmm? Morning, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Well, uh, Mr. Pettis, uh, it was uh, Reverend Paulette Legg. I was, uh, oh. that is you, correct? Right. Yes, no, 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 it's okay. You're, you'll, you'll be up in just a second, Mr. Pettis. Good morning. I'm deviating a bit from my usual uh, desire to speak to you, be introduced to you, get to know you, that we might have a place of camaraderie to begin a dialogue about uh, Oklahoma City and your work for the people thereof. And I digress for the purpose of joining those voices I've already heard this morning in celebration of a most memorable time, most memorable and a most monumental occurrence in the life of every American that would be to recognize and celebrate and offer another praise of thanksgiving to God for the nomination and acceptance and placement of the first African American female to the Supreme Court, the highest court of what God loves, truth, justice, equity, mercy in this country. Of course, I speak of none other than the most honorable Judge Kanaje Brown Jackson. I honor her I courage. I honor her stature as a human being. As she sat there and underwent the embarrassing and shameful barrage. 30 seconds, please. A very ignorant people in our Congress that tried to tear her down or make her feel like she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. She stood her ground and she sat there representing me remarkably. I honor her and I give her all her just due for being a woman of character, and I can't wait to see her in action at the Supreme Court. Thank you, Reverend. Thank Mike. you. Happy Easter. Same to you. Um, Carl Dixon? Boy, 
bit more that a bad black a marijuana all kind of people hanging around and knocking on people door at the heart of Motel like two times the Marabi I mean I know the puppy don't get it all about money. People ain't important I mean a needed at the a plea of dog need to do something to close the bit more down. It getting real bad. I mean, I mean, the lot, I, I know three people make my black here. Dog not going to do nothing. No, it all about money. Oh, don't want to keep it open. You kill people. Five people get killed. Why well, they get open? Got the money here. The money talk. I mean, things like the people don't care about people. It all about money. It all about money. People eat nothing. Baby, if people got a lot of money, they'll come and get them. When people don't have no money, they'll look at other way. 30 seconds, please. Do what? Left. 30 seconds. 15 seconds. <laughs> You're almost out of time. Do you have any final thoughts? Oh, well, he got it. You don't care about what happened to people. No, you don't. It all about money. No, what? You get bumpy and good. Everybody eat it a good. I don't care about people. I forget that you punch a low life people. I can punch a low life. Right. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Can we can we have someone look into what is happening yeah, at the Biltmore sure. and report to us, please? Sure. Can we tell them that? Yes. We'll yeah. have someone look into this situation. Someone's gonna meet you out in the lobby and, and kind of get more details. Okay. Are you mad? Am I going to jail? No, 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 no. We just want to talk to you and make sure we understand. No, you're fine. Thank you for coming. I know where I'm at. <laughs> yes. No. I'm sure. No problem. Okay. No problem. Thank you, sir. Mr. Pettis. John Pettis. You're up. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. John Pettis, 1208 Northeast 55th Street, Oklahoma City, 405-641-7566. I had not planned on speaking uh, today, but in sitting back there listening to what was discussed regarding the Oklahoma City Housing Authority, everyone who spoke has valid concerns. One of the concerns that I have is that there perhaps is a problem there at the authority. I think the solution uh, with what the item was today is that the next council meeting have two resolutions. One would be to pass the request that they have for the assistance under the affordable housing uh, allocation. Number two, I think the solution 
to what's going on is to increase the number of members on the Housing Authority's board from five to seven. And those additional council, those additional positions should be held by representatives of the city council. The city council uh, will, in the very near future, turn over $50 million worth of programming for the homeless. And that program is going to be administered by the Housing Authority. If there's problems now with the Housing Authority and the way that they're uh, approaching things and doing things, it's going to come back on this $50 million program that they'll be soon overseeing. And I think if the council who has the ultimate responsibility for the for the uh, for the uh, homeless program that the voters approved, that you should have a couple of representatives from the Horseshoe sitting there on the Housing Authority's board to avoid, I can't say avoid, but uh, to minimize some of the dissatisfaction with that agency. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes citizens who have signed up to speak, which brings us to item 14, adjournment, and we are adjourned.